spiked out I could trip a referee Tell by my attitude That I'm most definitely from Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Startup. Sorry for starting late. I was up to 4 a.m. playing poker at the TED conference. I have a 10-week-old baby at home. Uh, <laughs> I am exhausted. However, nothing gets my energy going like an amazing episode of This Week in Startups. It's like your vitamins. T watching This Week in Startups, if you're an entrepreneur, that's like taking your vitamins for the week. It empowers you to go and to kill and maul and succeed. Tyler, how are you doing? I'm great. Wow, that's an amazing insight. Yeah, for, once, uh, for once, I don't feel as tired as you, I think. I, yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is the time for employees of Mahalo. If you ever want to, like, ask me for a raise or anything, like, I am susceptible right now. The bag's under my eyes. I mean, I look like I'm dead. Um, and, but anyway, the TED conference last night. Yeah. Uh, t everybody knows what TED is, TED.com. TED is this legendary conference. I mean, it started by a guy named Richard Saul Warlman. It's called Te Technology Entertainment and Design is what it came from. Mm -hmm. It's the most elite, elitist conference in the world. Have you been to it? No. Never been to it. Neither have I. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, right? Yeah. You think a guy like me, been around for 15 years, I would have been right. to the conference. But no, I was banned from TED a decade ago for life. Jump in any time now, Tom. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm pausing for dramatic effect. Oh, okay, a little dramatic effect. Uh, so anyway, I have not gone to the event. However, there is a sub-little event that occurs at TED. Now, you have 2,000 people going to TED. They pay $6,000 a year, which to me is crazy because that is 60% of a buy-in for the World Series of Poker main event. It's 60% of, of your, your base currency. My base currency, right. which is buy-ins for the World Series of Poker. Right. It's 60% of a high society, as we say in the poker business. High society is 10 large. 10 large, of course, is $10,000. Uh, I'm not spend. I'm not throwing six grand away. That's like one and a half rims on the Tesla. I'm not, it's just not. I can't do it. It's a lot of mochas. And in your world, yeah. it's a lot of mocha. I mean, I don't know how many mochas, no jokers, you're going to get with that. That's like a thousand, twelve hundred mochas, thirteen hundred mochas. Anyway, there is uh, and Ed Borges asks, so why is Jason banned? How did he get banned? I can't talk about it. But anyway, I. When I was a younger kid, I was a little bit of a rabble rouser, unlike the decorum that I show today in everything I do. Pretty laid back guy now, respectful of course. Uh, but back then when I was 28, 29 years old and a journalist, I would, you know, maybe I rabble rouse a little bit from time to time. And the guy who was running it, Richard Saul Worman, and I got into a little beef. He said a couple of things, I said a couple of things. He was a little bit out of line, a little bit. and. When he was at a line, I said a couple of things. He said, you're never coming to my conference. I said, I'm not going to blank. You're blanking, blanking, blank of a blank conference. Then the conference got sold to another guy, Chris Anderson, who I knew. And Chris was like a video game editor or something. Now he's reincarnated as this, like, I don't know. He's like a monk or something. He's saving the world with this conference. Uh, and he's doing some good work, I guess. But to summarize it, and you can see the videos at TED. There's really intelligent, amazing talks. TED Talks are amazing. You're watching all of these, right? Yep. So you've never been to, but you watch these talks. You're a big fan of these. Yeah, exactly. Right. So people love it. Um, but I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid. And it's basically a way for a bunch of rich people who are liberals to go and cry about all the bad stuff that's going on in the world. And assuage, perhaps, their guilt about being so loaded. I don't have any guilt. I'm not going to go there and cry about malaria. I'm not going to go cry about all these. I'm, I'm creating jobs. I feel like as an entrepreneur, I'm doing the right thing. I, you know, I take care of my family. I create jobs for people. I mean, I, I feel bad about malaria. I feel bad about these issues. And, you know, I support whatever I can. But I, I'm not going to sit there and cry about every. You know how much bad stuff's been going on on this planet forever? Nature is brutal. I don't need to go to a conference and channel, oh, my God, I'm so, the world is so terrible. The world's not so terrible. This is the most peaceful time we've ever lived in. There's less people getting murdered and killed today than ever in the history of mankind. It's actually, a, we're in a good place. People are living forever. I mean, the, the, the life expectancy from 100 years ago was nothing. 
So anyway, all these people want to go cry. I'm not interested. However, there is a dinner at TED, and this is where the whole exclusionary, exclude everybody from everything gets out of control. They have a dinner at TED that my book agent, a guy named John Brockman, uh, he hosts. John is like the most famous guy in the world in science and technology. 50 people go to this dinner. I went to this dinner last night. It was hands down the most impressive room of people I have ever been in, in my life. I've been in a lot of impressive rooms. There were 50 people there, and somebody came up to me and said, Jason, I just counted. I think 16 billionaires, of the people in the room, 16 are billionaires. Bill Gates, literally Bill Gates, next to Ariana Huffington, next to the dude from Say Anything. Who's that guy? The movie Say Anything. I know who you're talking about. John Cusack. John Cusack. Yeah. John Cusack. Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, all these incredible authors, Larry and Sergey from Google, Evan Williams from Twitter. It, the list which went on and on and on of just incredible. And I, I'm not just, and Matt Groening from uh, The Simpsons fame was sitting next to me. I'm talking about The Simpsons. Uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon. It was incredible. And then I said, uh, Chad Hurley from YouTube. So I said, let's go play poker. Steve Case was there, yes. Uh, no Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, and this is the interesting about Jobs. Steve Jobs never coming to TED or to this event. Because as much as there's this elitist nonsense with like the 2,000 people go to TED, then there's this like, and not on purpose, but there's, you know, there's a dinner and you can only have a dinner for a small number of people. At, if, you, if you have a dinner for a small number of people and you happen to be the agent of all the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning, Nobel Prize winning people and scientists, and you draw these people, it's going to be a subsection of that. Well, this is the subsection of the most powerful and intellectual people on the planet. It was insane. Uh, but of course, I can't go to the event, but I get to go to the dinner that 2% of the people going to the event get to go to, which was pretty ironic. So then I see the event organizer, and I said, oh, hey, how you doing? Uh, can you leave me a day pass? <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny, because they don't get day pass. Anyway. Then we went and played poker. A bunch of people played poker uh, until 3 or 4 in the morning. I made like 900 clams. It was a $200 buying game. Uh, that's why I'm exhausted. So the money that you made from the poker. Yeah, 900. Do you maybe a G, maybe a, a thousand clams. This room full of geniuses, actually, when it comes to playing poker, it does I mean, Tyler. Yeah. I mean, look at this. I literally, I had my pocket filled with all these guys' money, and they're paying $6,000 to go to a conference. And this other guy, he buys in three times. He gives me... Like five hundred dollars, two hundred dollar buy in, two hundred dollar buy. I'm sorry, two hundred clams, two hundred clams. There's clams everywhere, and I said, he's like, starts complaining about the fact that I'm taking all his money. And I said, you paid six thousand dollars for a ticket. You're going all in with a pair of queens, and there's an ace and a king on the board. You, if you can afford to pay six thousand dollars for a ticket, you can afford to give me your four hundred dollars for playing the third best pair on the board. That's it. Anyway, but that's kind of like a poker player's dream, isn't it? To be uh in the room with oh, yeah. guys like that? Oh, yeah. That's what you want. You want rich guys who don't care. And the only mistake I made was it was 200 clams to buy in. I should have made it like too large. And then I would have come home with 8,000 8, clams. I don't think I can say like when you say dollars, you have to say clams or something like that. Anyway, uh, Bill Gates did not play. Uh, but I did, I did have a funny joke. I went to Larry Page, co-founder of Google, and I said, hey, Larry, do you play poker? He said, no. I said, do you have money? Everybody laughed, it was yeah. pretty funny. Well, obviously, this guy's got money, it's worth $15 billion. Yeah. And actually, that's what somebody said, like, oh, you know the top four guys here are worth $100 billion combined? That means it's like the gross national product of like all of Africa or something. Uh, anyway, we've had a big week. Lots of things going on. We announced the Open Angel Forum is gonna be in uh, New York and San Francisco. This is four cities. Uh, and if you would like to apply, what do people do? Go to openangelforum.com. Okay. And so what if, who can apply? For startups, yes. anyone is welcome to apply. Although right. I think in all fairness, um, the, the competition is fairly tough. And the ones that are getting through to the final five. Yes. Describe the, the qualities of those they, people. They tend to have something that's usable on the, you know, that you can go to and type in. It's not... This is not like a napkin competition. 
Okay, it's for the not, best idea. So what you mean is it's not like a business plan competition. You actually mm. have to have a working product. So right. if you're working on the business plan, you should call into Shark Tank right. on This Week in Startups, but you're not ready for Open Angel Forum. Right. If you have the product built like Maroon Door did or whatever, right. or maybe GeekStack does now, then you might qualify. Right. Uh, and, and not only these final five, not only do they have something that's working, but they tend to be right at that point where they're starting to get some good user adoption. So users are using the product. doesn't have yeah. to be a gazillion. Um, right. It just has to be some. It can be in beta. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know beta. what, um, interestingly enough, uh, users are using? Hmm. Bing? They're using Bing. And Bing is the proud sponsor of This Week in Startups. It's called the Segway. Let me just try to do these incredible segues. Um, and here is a great search for Olympic opening ceremony. Everybody knows tonight's the Olympic opening ceremony. And look at these incredible features. You hover over the CBC News here. I guess that's Canadian Broadcasting Company. And it starts video. Well, you can't see it there because the screen's so small. But if I zoom in, what you'll notice is the video is playing. Video previews. That's dope. That's innovation. Google doesn't have that. Yahoo doesn't have that. Then, hey, I'm looking at this Olympics page from Wikipedia. Boom, I hit the side. It's another preview. This is efficient searching. These are great features. I wish I had some of these features on Mahalo, if we're frank. Uh, we'll be stealing some of these features from them. Uh, and boy, is Bing doing a great job. They're gaining market share. Only person in the market who's doing that. And they're really being a very great competitive uh, player in the market. And so I give them a lot of credit. And their maps are great. Video is great. We've been through this a couple times on the show. Uh, Twitter integration, great. Previews are great. And the search results, if you take their search results, I'll be honest here, their te top 10 and Google's top 10, and Yahoo's even, you take the three logos off, it's very hard to tell the difference. So what really search is about is organizing the information and the features and the user interface around it. Everybody agrees on that, and Bing is doing a great job at it, and I really appreciate them sponsoring the show. Uh, so uh, what else? Did something else happened this week I feel like I need to tell the audience. There was a bonus episode yesterday. Yes, there was a bonus episode. There was a bonus episode. You were, it was a school, you were calling in remote. I, every, well, you know this because you handle these things. I mean, how many schools a year contact us, they want me to come speak there? It's a lot of schools. Yeah. And so we decided with one of these schools, they said, you don't have to come across the country to, was it Penn? Yeah. Entrepreneurs at Penn. And so they, um, they called in over Skype and we did a video and I said why don't we record this and give it to the audience because it might be interesting and we'll play a little video from that later. Um, was there something else that occurred? We went to New York Monday. Oh yeah, we had a one day trip to New York. We had a little uh, important business meeting and for, pro for a project, Project L. Can't talk about Project L. Um, then uh, we stopped by Dog Patch Labs. We're in New York. We saw Joe from Local Bacon, TechCrunch yep. 50 company. We went to see uh, uh, Lockhart Steel from Curbed. Yep. We went by and saw Nick Denton at um, Gawker. Gawker, and he showed us his designs for the Apple tablet yep. of the Gawker blogs. Very interesting, good looking stuff. He's really thinking good. Where else did we go? Uh, da, 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 Challenge right? Post. Oh, we went to see Challenge Post, and they were doing a great job. Yep. I don't know, what episode was Challenge Post, Duncan? Some of the super fans tell me in the, in the chat room. I uh, went to see Brandon from Challenge Post. They're doing amazing things. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited about that investment and how they're doing. Um, what else did we do? Anyway, mm. we also had dinner. Dinner, yeah. We had dinner with a bunch of peep, uh, pe peeps in uh, New York. We saw everybody. So anyway, I, I can't believe we did all this in a week. In one week, we're in New York, dinners, meetings. It's crazy. Um, and the show is getting amazing guests. And did they do a show before this one? Yes. What was the show before this one? This week in Twitter. This week in Twitter with Lon Harris? Yeah. How was it? I didn't get to see it. Did anybody in the chat room see it? How did it is it going well? Because I, I have to watch it. I'm going to put it on my iPhone and watch it when I'm playing poker or something. Um, and then after this, this week, oh, it says, uh, Mickey Moran says it was good. Um, Twitter had 300 viewers. Excellent. Excellent. Um, hashtag trivia. Oh, very good. Yeah, Lon is an excellent host. Uh, and Lon works here at Mahalo. So um, very excited about the guests we have coming up and also the guest we have today. Uh, James Siegel is here with us today. He is the CEO and co-founder of Edgecast. Uh, president. President. It's all right. I, we have a CEO as my business partner. So, gotta, so what did you do? You spot. flip a coin? Who's president and CEO? Basically, he's taller and better looking, so he got right. the slot. All right. I, I feel you. That's the same way I feel about Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> the way Ty Tyler's the new CEO. I'm the new president. Um, so James is here. We've known each other for a long time. Serial entrepreneur. 
a uh, partner of Mahalo and local here and crushing it, raised a couple of rounds of funding, multiple business exits, all this kind of amazing stuff, which we'll talk about in the interview segment. But before we get to that, you've seen the show before. I've seen it just a few times. So. Just a few times. Uh, we have, uh, oh, somebody's saying Edgecast has a pretty good philosophy. Interesting. We'll hear about that later. There's people in the chat room know you guys. Um, so, uh, everybody loves uh, Ask Jason as a segment. And we have a special caller today. I'm pretty blown away by the caller. Let's, uh, let's do an Ask Jason here. Phone is ringing. Infographics. All right, I'm now answering the phone. Uh, it's a caller, and he's, I think he's calling from the New York area. Caller, are you there? Hey, Jason, it's Joel. Oh, it's Joel. From Joel Stack Spolsky. Overflow. <laughs> Welcome to the program, Joel. Uh, Joel Spolsky, of course, of Stack Overflow, the awesome question and answer site, and also uh, Joel on Software, the incredible blog. Uh, People in the chat room are going crazy. Uh, Fog Creek, everybody knows Joel. Joel's a famous guy. I don't know why Joel's calling it. I should be doing Ask Joel. Uh, <laughs> well, but <laughs> well, do you have okay, a question? You one afterwards. Yeah, okay. We'll do, actually, I will we'll do that. For you. So let me hear the question. Well, because you know, we haven't. Uh, I, I, Fog Creek is a bootstrapped company. And right. We wanted it that way. We wanted to gently grow it quietly. Um, you know, I wanted to do one startup in my whole life that I wanted to be a place to work at for my whole life. And I didn't want VCs, you know, taking that away or anything. True. Sure. Um, but having done that, having established that, uh, it turns out that my second startup, which is Stack Overflow, is a little bit more of a uh, swing of the fences kind of situation. Okay. Possibly. Sure. So we're starting to get um, serious interest from some VCs. Uh, and we have uh, one particular VC uh, that we really like. We like the person. We like the partner. He's got the right kind of experience. You know, it's a decent firm. It's a good firm. And... Uh, we're presenting to the partners. That's the stage we're at. We haven't yet presented to all the partners. Right. But, um, I, 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 you know, so I don't want to say it's a... Now, this is basically what we got without going out looking for capital. This right. Is just, this fell in your lap. They came to us. Yeah. And, awesome. And various other... You know, VC sends us little gifts all the time, so I think we're on their radar. Sure. Um, so here's my question for you. The question is, do we just go with this, or do I take six months off and go walk up and down Sand Hill Road and try to get competitive, competitive bids? Okay, this is a great question. Um, a lot of people who are uh, first-time entrepreneurs, uh, or first, or entrepreneurs who have or are doing their first time raising capital, like you are, um, they get in this situation. A VC contacts them. Uh, the VC is impressive. Maybe they've got a good track record. Maybe they invested in some great companies. The partner, you you hit it off, and you're like, this is the greatest thing ever. Uh, much like when you uh, go to a new high school or college, or maybe you move to a new city and you meet a new boyfriend or girlfriend, you're like, oh my God, this is the greatest girl ever. But you just moved to the city. You don't know exactly if this is the best girlfriend or boyfriend ever. Uh, and you probably want to date a little bit. You probably want to see what else is out there. So uh, there is a way to do this without actually insulting everybody, uh, which is um, you say you're running a process and that your partners and you uh, this is the way to say it diplomatically to the VC you currently have. Uh, listen, we have a lot of interest from a number of people, and I'm sure you understand that my partners and I, the shareholders in the company, the, the people who work at the company, would like to actually meet everybody and make a really educated decision because we're going to be uh, you know, working with whoever we take this investment from in all likelihood for three to seven years, probably five. Yep. Uh, and that's what it takes. So um, we really appreciate your interest. Right now, we would be blown away to work with you. Um, but we need probably about two weeks to finish our rounds, and uh, then we're going to come back to you, and we're going to ask for a term sheet, and uh, we're going to look at the offers we have. We're going to compare them and uh, see who we think is the best partner for us. Uh, are you okay with that? I just want to make sure I, I, I sort of be transparent with you, and I don't want to waste your time. And, of course, they're going to say to you, because what, what else can they say? Of course. Yeah, of oh, course. of course. Run your process. There's no problem. <laughs> Um, sure. Yeah, and I'm not. I'm a little. I, I'm. I'm not that worried about necessarily insulting anyone. Right. Uh, so much as just you know, I know it takes a long time to go through that process, and you know, people tell stories of it being six months and nine months and a year, um, and you know, and that's time that we could be building our business. It's six months or nine months when the idea is not good. Oh. Okay. It is six days when the idea is amazing and great. And it might be six weeks when the idea is somewhere between those two things. 
So, for example, yeah. with Mahalo, it was like 10 days. Uh, other companies I've been involved with, they go on the road. It takes three months. It takes two or three months. So I would say ballpark, since you have this one ready to go in all likelihood, and you're going to present to the partner, the amount of time it takes to prepare and present to their partnership and what you learn there, you're going to um, have done 90% of the work. So then you should just do what we call a road show. You should go to Sand Hill Road. You pick the 10 yep. VC firms that you like best. And the way you pick them is look at what they've invested in, what exits they've had. Yep. And uh, you can just contact them and say, listen, we're doing a process. We've had some interest. Would you like to see what we're doing? Very short email. And uh, then link mm -hmm. to your very impressive um, Quantcast ratings that you've broken into the top 1,000 sites on the internet in uh, just like under a year. Uh, very impressive. Yeah. Without any resources is to, to speak of. Um, let me ask James, who is here with me from Edgecast, who's, I think you've raised capital twice or maybe three times? Uh, in different companies, different yeah. entities, yeah. So what, what, you heard my response. You heard Joel's concerns. Um, is this a major time suck? Is it worth it to see 5, 10, 15? How many, on average, do you go visit? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, and it's different, difficult to come up with a hard and fast rule. I'd say if you've worked with venture capitalists before and you feel like you have a good sense for judging them, reviewing them, evaluating them, then you could probably get the process done to Jason's point pretty quickly. I mean, especially someone like you or me who's been through it is going to get, yeah. get through these guys quick. But if you haven't necessarily done it before, you might want to take a little extra time. So you might want to you know, go through and actually you know, spend some time getting to know these folks, do a lot of reference calls. That's the key thing. Uh, so I even if you get in bed with some folks, and let's say you narrow it down to three or four, and they all make you good offers, uh, you need to take a lot of time before you decide. You want to call every CEO who's ever worked with them. You want to ask these guys, hey, who have you invested in that doesn't like you? Who, uh, wh which of your investments have failed? Those are the folks you want to talk to. And you want to get on the phone with Jason and me and everybody you know and find out from your sort of network what these guys are really like. Because they're sitting on your board. They're making your life either living hell or uh, it can be a great three to six year run. Exactly. I mean, you have to pick this like picking a spouse or a partner. It's that serious. It's really that serious. You will spend... Uh, and, and there will be hard times. It, it, no, no company, even if, you, if you're successful, there's going to be a lot of hard times yeah. because nothing breeds contempt like success, <laughs> I can tell you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I've been involved in some very successful things. Holy cow, some people lose their SHIT. Like, I can't curse on this show because I'm going to get problems with the iTunes because Steve Jobs doesn't like people cursing <laughs> on the podcast. But um, you've got to be really careful. And uh, somebody in the chat room asked, what is Sand Hill Road? Sand Hill Road, you can just type it into... Um, uh, uh, Wikipedia or Mahalo and, uh, or Bing, any of those amazing services. <laughs> and what you will see is Santo Road is an area, it's like a, a little, literally a road in um, Palo Alto, out in uh, Silicon Valley in California, Northern California, just south of San Francisco, about 20 minutes south of San Francisco. And there are literally hundreds, probably 200, 300 venture capital firms there. They all have the same buildings, and you can, in one day, visit five VC firms for an hour each and drive less than one mile between them mm -hmm. and walk actually in the same buildings and, and, and complex. So um, the one thing that James said that I want to just highlight is he said you have to call and ask for references. This will make you look very, very astute to the venture capitalists. So when uh, I was working with Sequoia, and Roloff Botha was you know, interested in Mahalo, and I was interested in Sequoia Capital, obviously, who wouldn't be? Uh, and they said, um, you know, we're interested, and in, uh, do you have a couple of references, people you've worked with? And of course, yeah, here's my partner, Brian Alvey, and here's this person, here's that person. And, um, and I, sa I, I said to them, like, actually, I didn't even say to them. I looked at who Roloff had worked with before on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I, I contacted those people on my own. Oh, yeah. And I just emailed them and said, hey, do you have five minutes to discuss what it's like to work with Sequoia? And then when I talked to uh, Roloff at the next meeting, he's like, oh, you know, I heard you were talking to some of our CEOs. Mm -hmm. I was like, yes, of course, they had such amazing things to say about you. And when you talk to them, say, What's, what do you think their weaknesses are? You know, it's standard questions. But uh, there's also another great site, thefunded.com, run by Adeo, uh, who does the Funded Institute, uh, which is a high, both are high-quality products in my estimation. And the Funded is... Um, uh, sort of anonymous uh, commentary by startups that I think is probably about 90% correct, probably about 10% fake. So sort of like Yelp or anything else on the web that's a, that's a message board, review board. 
Uh, and overall, you'll, you'll get some interesting insights into uh, your VCs. You know, one other quick comment is there's the partner that invests in your company, and that's like a direct relationship. Yes. But then there's the actual firm itself. Correct. Because you got to keep in mind that you might have this great relationship with this partner. They sit on your board, they invest, and then they hop to another firm. You got some stranger who you don't really know who's sitting on your board. Correct. So you got to make sure, A, that it's a good relationship with your partner, but B, that there's a backup relationship and a, another yes. backup relationship. Because what if they leave the firm and this yeah. happens? Uh, you know, you think, ah, I got the greatest guy since sliced bread on my board or mm. gal. They leave. They go to another firm. <laughs> Somebody else is during your board and they're, and they're busting your chops. You're like, I yeah. didn't sign up for this. You know, like I'm an adult. I don't need you to come here and ask me what my China strategy is or <laughs> what, what will Stack Overflow do if Microsoft decides if Google, to... If Google goes into your business. Yeah, yeah. If, Google goes in, if Microsoft decides to put a Stack Overflow in every... You know, web development kit. And, you know, what, what will you do? You know, and it's like I don't, I don't there's know. There's a link on the desktop. <laughs> exactly. They're gonna put a link on the desktop to Microsoft Overflow. You know, it's like relax. Um, so uh, this is this is good. I now since we have you on the phone, and I had sent yeah. you a private message because I always ask Joel when I have questions about developers because although I'm a CEO, I am and I did very bad development of Lotus Notes and scripting. And it was a horrible program, but Joel is actually an excellent programmer. And so I asked you a question in an email. Um, I want to share with the rest of the audience, which is, I've been reading this book on, I should say reading, I don't read. Uh, that, I read email, but I listen to Audible. And Audible has a book called Talent is Overrated. It's an awesome book. It talks about, the basic premise of the book is like, listen, Tiger Woods and Mozart, they were not inherently good at what they did. They had parents who uh, took off from work and spent all their time doing deliberate practice with them to get better. And so my question to you is, since you work with developers and know their mindset very well, how can the concept of deliberate practice, or just how in general, do programmers get better at what they do? And should a startup company uh, do something with their time uh, with developers to actually have them develop their skills and get better in practice, or is the practice inherent in what they do every day? Uh, it's a good question, and it depends on the type of development they're doing. Um, so there's a certain class of developers. They used to be called COBOL programmers, and then they were called Visual Basic programmers, and now they're called Java programmers. And that class of programmers, uh, and now I'm, obviously this is a huge generalization, uh, but that class of programmers are often just doing the same thing for year in and year out. Like they made one report, and then they made another report, and then they made another report, and they made another report. Then they made an input screen for the first report. And then they made an input screen for the second report, and they you know repeat for 14 years. They're not learning anything. And uh, on the other hand, there's another class of developers that are really kind of always learning new things. And what you'll generally see is that they're using a reasonably modern technology at work, whatever the technologies are, because they would be bored in a VB or a Java shop. Um, so they're working somewhere in Python or Ruby. And uh, at home, they're, they're, they've got list compilers that they wrote themselves, and they're using weird academic languages that have just been invented, and they're always trying that stuff out on their new projects. And, of course, they're, you know, they're, they're bloody from the experience, uh, but they are sort of learning new things. And so um, you know, if, you're in that, if you're in that first category and you, you could say that your last year of developer experience is pretty much the same as the year before it, uh, then you're not, you're not really learning new stuff, and, and there's, there's definitely some obvious things uh, to start with. And I have recommendations for people. Like if you've never learned a functional programming language, um, you know, there are great, great ways to do that. Um, so learn a functional programming language, um, Lisp or Scheme or, or one of those type languages. If you've never uh, done anything in a, in a low-level language just for kicks, learn some assembler or C if you've never done that. So there's, ah. there's ways to really kind of broaden your brain. If, you're, if you've never done Python or Ruby, good God, you know, get out there and do that for, 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 for a fun project. Um, now, from from our position as the business owner or the or the employer of these of these programmers, uh, you know, a common thing is to give them a couple of days off to do you know whatever project you want with whatever tool you want. You know, Google has something called twenty percent time, so if you come in on the weekends, <laughs> you can spend. Yeah, that's sort of the joke of it. If you come one hundred twenty percent time. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> doing something. Um, but, you know, some other companies will often do that formally. They'll, like, literally say, all right, we're taking two days off, whatever it is that we're doing, ah. and everybody just, just built something. And it sort of depends on the, the type of uh, situation you're in, but, um, you know, like, if you have uh, a tool, you can you can ask people to try to make plugins for that tool, um, you know, or make their own personal site, you know, whatever it may be. Um, you know, just something where they want to learn something new and they want to kind of uh, kind of stretch and do something a little mm. bit different. And you'll find that they'll almost always 
if they're if they're good programmers and they're curious, they'll want to use a new programming language or, or some new tool that they haven't used before. Right. Okay. This is great advice. My group falls into the latter. I am very uh, thankful for the for your advice because my team is doing just that. They have been embracing things like Django and Cassandra and teaching each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only thing we really don't do here because we're on a pretty aggressive competitive schedule is the 20% time. Uh, that being said, I think that this will be the year, year basically four of Mahalo, when we actually could, now that we're getting overstaffed uh, and trying to have maybe 50% more developers than we need, we could actually rotate people on a sort of like maybe 25% of the staff could be doing, say, we could put yeah. them in a room and say, hey, do something like X. Um, depending uh, depending on the on the culture of your organization, you may actually find some benefit to that. So, I'm thinking of um, uh, cert certain companies. You know, uh, the investment banks have a reputation, believe it or not, uh, because they want to hire the best developers in the world. Like Goldman Sachs prides themselves on only having you know M PhDs from MIT or whatever, and uh, those guys don't want to work on what Goldman Sachs needs them to work on. Uh, so they pretty much give them free reign. Or they give them a little bit of free reign in terms of what technology they're using, what tools they're using. Right. And if you walk into one of those investment banks, you'll find that the entire development team is always porting their entire trade management system from one programming language to another programming language. That's right. Just a little bit cooler. <laughs> and it's a complete waste of time, and it's a complete waste of money, and their managers know right. this. But they let them because that's what it takes to have the PhDs from MIT working on your trading system. You know, is that they want to rewrite it from, from Python, which was hot three weeks ago, to Clojure, which is hot this week. Huh. Interesting. Uh, so in a situation like that, you know, you might even benefit from 20% time. You might say, you know what, you guys do whatever the hell you want on Friday, but Monday through Thursday, you work on the Java trading application. No right. risk. Well-known technologies. Yep. Get your learning kicks from something else. Right. Awesome. Uh, that's, probably, that's probably the Google philosophy a little bit, is they don't I, want you yeah. doing things like mm, Google Buzz and then rolling it out on Gmail and ruining their whole business. <laughs> uh, I love it. I know terrifying you, the what do you What do you think? Of, you, you think it's too terrifying, too much, too fast, too aggressive? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, it's yeah. sort of like, what happened to Google Wave? Weren't we supposed to all be doing Google Wave three weeks ago? I yeah, mean, I just think it's... Google reinventing email. Yeah. Uh, I'm loving it, um, but I'm an edge case, obviously, but... Uh, Holy cow, is well, it? Well, they're frightening people, and they're doing it on one of their core assets. Not their super core asset, but, you know, one of their core assets. Can you it's imagine a, if they did something like that to their advertisers? Uh, a little bit crazy, Anything. but, you know, Even I... just change the font in AdWords. The, the advertisers would go nuts. You know what? You're right. Uh, they yeah. would. However, I think they see Facebook as such a competitive threat that they're willing to take the risk. Uh, Joel, yeah. thank you for calling in. Thank you for answering sure. my question. James, do you have anything to add to that on the, um, on the keeping smart people engaged and... Yeah, I'd be, I'd be curious for Joel's feedback as well because, you know, we run a big network. We're pushing a ton of traffic, growing at a phenomenal rate. And the reason our engineers like it is because they get to break things all the time. Right. And what they like about breaking things is, of course, they get to fix things. Yes. And so mm -hmm. um, that is something that people really get turned on about. So I think that if you're in a more stable environment and it's maybe a little less action-packed, that must be tough. I, 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 one, every other day I wish I was in a stable environment, but I'm not. You, what you're referring to <laughs> is firemen, uh, fire pe firefighters. Trying to use a non, I always try to use a non-gender specific. Mm. It's hard to do when fire you, people. No, firefighters. That's it. <laughs> there it's you like go. Non-gender specific. It's like the firefighters who go and then light a fire in the mountains so they can go light it on fire. That's what you're saying, right? That's what your people do. Yeah, but it's also they cause chaos in order to fix. I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> they don't no, do but that. but they do push the cutting edge <laughs> of technology, right? So yes. if you can get certain productivity out of a yeah. server or a switch or a router, they want to do it, and then we break it. Then you want to take it to the next. You want to double right. or triple the productivity. Yeah. I well, think that's, um, that's the great thing about a startup, and that's going to happen naturally in a startup, is that whatever was working three weeks ago, if you're growing at the right rate, is not working anymore. Yeah. And Absolutely. so, you know, those are opportunities to learn things, and, and that's what's sort of fun about it. I mean, Jeff Atwood, who is the uh, sort of the tech lead on Stack Overflow, had a great time building his own servers and then adding memory to the servers when they fell down and then adding more servers when the one server couldn't handle it. And uh, and that was really like a, a learning process for him. He'd never done that stuff before, and was really interesting and fun. And uh, that's I mean that's why I like startups. I've been doing Fog Creek now for ten years, and every year is different. You know what I have to do and what I'm what I'm facing. You prefer to be a samurai as opposed to being a rice farmer. I understand, Joel. <laughs> yeah. it's, my, it's my new analogy. It's mm. like everybody in the world, every okay. the 90, 90 percent of people in the world, they work on a rice farm. Rice they collect farmer. the rice. And the 10% of us who yep. start companies and the people who work for our companies and with us are the samurai, and we protect the village. Uh, okay, uh, good seeing you last week in New York, and um, yep. 
I uh, will talk to you soon. The best place for people to find you is obviously at what? Joelonsoftware.com. Joelonsoftware.com. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers. All right. Thanks, Jason. I love the celebrity ass Jason. This is a whole new thing. We should have celebrity ass Jason. That's pretty cool. I mean, I'm, I, you know Joel, right? Obviously. Sure. I mean, it's like I'm, a, I'm like a Joel fanboy. I love when he, um, I love his blog and everything. If you're in the technology space, you know who he is and you know what he does. So we have to work on that some more. Um, but you know what you don't have to work on, Tyler? Uh, Power VPS? No, you don't have to work on Web it. Close. Power. You don't have to work <laughs> on uh, having your servers up and running. And you don't have to worry about your email servers filling up and the storage breaking and, and viruses. And did you update the servers? If you use DNA mail, DNA mail, everybody loves DNA mail. DNA mail has been a sponsor of This Week in Startups since the beginning. We're 41 episodes in. We have nine more episodes to the big 50th episode, which we will be having a huge blowout party for probably on the Microsoft campus up in the Valley. They, they're really interested in doing it there. Uh, and DNA Mail is awesome. If you would like to go try it, it's a free 30-day trial, uh, free activation and setup, free 24-hour support, 999999999% uptime or something to that effect. There's a lot of nines in it. Two ninety-five a month, unlimited email, and they also do um, Google Docs, uh, Google Domains, yes. And they have been a great sponsor of the show. Don't screw around with putting up your own email server. That's crazy talk doing IT when you're at a startup company. So uh, the next segment is Jason Shark Tank. And uh, in this one, they're going to pitch us, James, nice. on their business idea. They will have 60 seconds. And then we will criticize it harshly. And we will break them down uh, to the point at which they either get inspired to do better or they go back to picking rice in the fields. It's no fun if someone doesn't cry. Basically, is our, that's our motto here. What do they call it? The, the rice fields? What are they patties. Called? Are they patties? Is it rice, rice patties? Rice patties. I don't know, Tyler. You lived in Japan? You didn't? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. All right. Can we get the first shark tank, please? Okay, Jason Shark Tank coming up here. Uh, Rob, Rob from Rob, the. Claire. Okay, Rob, take it easy. Don't get crazy. You, you're gonna you're gonna have 60 full seconds. Don't jump the gun, or I'll have to penalize okay. you five seconds. Uh, Rob, you're calling from the 203, which I recognize. That is Hoboken, New Jersey. No, where is 203? Uh, it's uh, Connecticut. I uh, did my PhD in New Haven. Oh, I did. Oh, PhD. PhD in what? Uh, computational biology. Oh, excuse me. Somebody just rated your pitch a 5.5 based on your PhD. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, have, is this your first time uh, tuning into the show? Uh, have you listened to uh, the no, show? No, no, I've seen it before. Okay. No, I've seen you guys before. Do you have a favorite episode, perhaps? A uh, favorite guest? Uh, I, thought, uh, I, th I mean, I watched a few of them. The Mingly one was good. I thought that, I thought that was interesting. The who? Mingly? Mingly. Oh, oh, you're talking about uh, somebody who pitched on startups. I was talking about the guest. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Okay. So, uh, you know, the, the rules are you have 60 seconds. I'm going to ask yep. everybody who is in the chat room to rate, and I'll ask James as well because he will be giving commentary on uh, your pitch. Rate uh, your pitch uh, 1 to 10 based on two things. Number one, the quality of the, of the actual pitch, how well you did pitching the idea, and then two, the merit of the idea. So those are two different okay. numbers. Uh, and in the chat room, you will put pitch, colon, the number, and then you will put idea, colon, a number. Are you ready to go? I am ready to go. Okay. Uh, let's put the clock at 60 seconds, and three, two, go. Okay, so this is short and sweet. Uh, basically, language learning is a hard problem, and it usually involves boring classrooms and drills. So at Babelflix, we're basically changing all that by using streaming movies, television, and music videos to teach language. So conceptually, you can kind of think about it as uh, a Rosetta Stone's interactive language learning software meets Netflix's on-demand streaming movie service. And our business plan will basically give you uh, unlimited uh, downloads of shows uh, with the Babelflix language learning platform for about $20 to $30 a month. And that's it. Okay. Uh, you did that in a record-breaking uh, 35 seconds. Uh, that was I, the goal. Did in 35 seconds. Always, Tyler says, finishing in 
less than the allotted time is good. Leave people wanting more. I see pitch seven, idea five. I see uh, pitch five, pitch eight, pitch five, pitch seven, pitch nine, idea eight, four, idea eight, idea five, pitch seven. It's all over the map. Uh, okay. But people think you did a good job pitching. Pitch seven, idea six, pitch six, idea five, idea eight. I think off the top of my head, I like uh, the space because um, there's money in it. Obviously, Rosetta Stone has proven that. Uh, yes. There was something exciting about the idea of watching shows. It's kind of appealing that I would be entertained while I'm learning. That seems intuitively like a good idea. Um, yep. So I liked it. I would give the pitch like a, you know, a six, seven, which I think is like a solid pitch, maybe a seven, a solid pitch. I would have liked a little bit more specifics, maybe just a little specifics okay. of why that's a better way to do it. If you could say it in okay. like five in a sentence, like this is better because. Uh, mm -hmm. or we have some proprietary technology, or it's just something. And then I think on the mm -hmm. idea, same thing. If I had, I give the idea like a seven, six, seven, because I don't know exactly what the advantage is or how it works. So let me, okay. before you answer these questions, I want to get James uh, blunt feedback. So I'd say the pitch was great. I thought succinct, well articulated. I'd give it an eight, actually, from a pitch perspective. Mm. Uh, from an idea perspective, probably more like a six. Uh, the two things that were missing for me were, at the beginning you talked about the demand side of things. I want to know the size of the market. So something like, hey, this is a billion dollar market. Because I, I, I really just don't have a sense of how much money there is out there. Right. And then on the yeah, flip yeah. side, you talked about what uh, the price, you know, you say, hey, you know, 20, 30 bucks a month kind of thing. I guess I want to know a little bit more about how you're going to make money in that. So it's the kind of thing where, like, hey, we can charge people 20 to 30 bucks a month, and it takes them a year to learn a language. So, boom, I know what it is. Because when I hear 20 to 30 bucks a month, how long does it take to actually learn a language? So is somebody going to be using this for one month, or are they going to use it for a year? Okay. And before he answers those questions, I have on my laptop here Babelflix, Babelflix's Watch and Learn Technology in 50 Seconds. We're going to play it a little bit because if you, uh, you might have been able to in another setting actually play this. So let's just watch a couple seconds of this. And um, am I assuming correctly that the, vid the audio from this you guys will hear or no? To the technical team, no. So we're not going to hear the audio. So I'll just play it. We'll talk over it um, so everybody sees it. I see I am watching what looks like a samurai film. And um, it says I should, oh, it's like a, Choose uh, an adventure. Is that what it's doing here? No, no, no. It's uh, it's basically giving you some interactivity with the movie ah. itself. So uh, we basically do some pre-processing, add words. metadata, and then ah. you can uh, add lesson plans and teach words and, and, and language as you're going along. Um, and then there's also interactivity with the uh, movie player to to uh, help you uh, uh, you know replay words, look up words, and whatnot. Okay. Um, Tyler's looking at it as well. Uh, I know Tyler speaks Japanese. Uh, Tyler, does this look like an effective way to... Uh, and what did you think, Tyler? More interestingly, I'm learning Mandarin, which is, uh, <laughs> so, um, which is what he's doing here. The, I think it's brilliant, because I think people learn visually. And I learned a lot of my Japanese from Japanese pop songs and Japanese movies mm. and found it an incredibly valuable way to learn. Okay. Uh, that I think has not been utilized. It's more engaging. I think young people today are like, they're in that stimulated mode when they're watching movies and listening yeah. to songs. And I mean, as a little test of this, yeah. you, I, and maybe this would be a crazy thing to include in your pitch, is it's actually really easy to teach someone a Twinkle Twinkle Little Star in another language. Ah. They'll learn 20 <laughs> words that otherwise would, they would never, ever, ever, ever get. Very right. quick because of the melody. Ah, and it's so ingrained. Yeah, and then, and then you see, this Look is my this. point, is because, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star, now you remember the words. Mm. Interesting. So. Um, Tyler's on my PR team. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so, Tyler, you didn't give it a rating. What do you, what do you rate it? Um, conceptually, uh, go the other way around. Pitch-wise, uh, seven. I think it get, you left out a little bit, as Jason said, market size, like James says, is kind of important. And uh, adding a little more hook like why why this is actually better give some kind of fact even a, uh, I think it missed a couple core st statistics like grounded mm -hmm. in some facts right that okay you wet the appetite and, and the idea conceptually I put it at nine. Oh wow okay yeah. so uh, and before you saw the actual video yeah I had, well, I'd seen the video before oh, okay so but if you hadn't seen the video mm, would it be the same or a little less Video is yeah. pretty powerful. Videos, the video explains it better. I think after I see the yeah. video, I'm, I sort of feel like eight or nine. Yeah. Like I, this is the, this is the kind of company that I might actually invest in. 
like I'm kind of intrigued on that level. What's the status of the company? Have you raised money or no? Uh, we we did we had a we had a raise, but it fell through. So we're uh, back to uh, back to beating the uh, pavement. So. And you tell me again where you're based. Uh, we're based out of New York. Oh, okay, very good. Um, but but uh, like... we're 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 open to uh, we're open to relocation. Ah, okay. Uh, well, I mean, what you should be open to is coming to the Open Angel Forum in New York in April and pitching. Uh, I was so... I was there, I was at the uh, forum in New York uh, yesterday. Actually. Oh, good. Um, I think that yeah. you might. This is and when we when Tyler talked earlier in the program about what gets into Open Angel Forum, this is the type of like really good idea that's got some uh, really good execution. Maybe not traction in the market yet, but maybe before, you know, two months between or in the next six weeks, it could get a couple people. I'll tell you one thing about it. I was not psyched about it being uh, a foreign movie for an American mm -hmm. audience. So I wonder if you could do this for Gladiator, since I can mm -hmm. basically know the script to Gladiator, like right. the back of my hand, or if you could have somebody dub... Um, a movie where people, like a cult-like movie where people know all the words, like, I don't know. Yeah, Rocky, yeah. Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah, no, I mean, that's I, like I think too what, ultimately I'm what we're going to have to do is do a little bit of uh, R&D testing on which actually works the best ah. with, uh, like, you know, whether it's, it's foreign movies, uh, learning uh, uh, that language uh, and using your native language or, or vice versa, you know, using Gladiator when you're learning Japanese, for instance, or, uh, so it, it's, that's, that's, I guess, a bit of an open question. Right, and you know what's interesting is if he, Godfather would be a good one for certain. I mean, it's gonna be different for different yeah, people. But yeah. Godfather guys can recite like crazy. Yeah, I am absolutely yeah. certain that they have dubbed Godfather into fifty languages. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and so that would be a perfect candidate, actually. Do you have the rights to use movie clips for educational purposes like this? Uh, so what, what what we what we can do, I think, is we can use. Uh, we can work with institutions, uh, you know, at universities and language schools, and we can use their educational license. Now, we will need to license content. Um, from what I've, I've understood, I've talked to some people who source content, and it shouldn't be too big of a deal. Uh, just on the grounds that we, if, if we're trying to get the latest movie, you know, the movie that came out yesterday on DVD, we're not going to get it. But movies, you know, once they pass their expiry date, they're pretty open to, uh, to opening up their catalog to that kind of stuff. Um. Okay, very interesting. Uh, stay in touch. I liked it a lot. You'll probably Great. be hearing from Scott Simcoe, the super fan blogger on This Week in Startups, um, who will probably want to uh, keep up with your story, and we'll talk to you soon. Great. Thanks a Cheers. lot, guys. Have a good day. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with that one. And we have a second one. I guess we're doing two today. Mm. Um, we usually do one, but we'll do two. Okay, uh, Sean calling from the 435. Uh, are you ready to go, and did you see the previous caller? I did, and yes, I am. Okay, now, after having seen that previous caller, are you in any way intimidated? Not in the least. I love it. Bring nice. it. Bring Good. it. Uh, now, have you been listening to the show for a long time? And do you have a favorite yeah, episode or every, segment? I've heard every episode. I think uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. He's, he's okay. kind of a nut, and I like that. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk is a nut. That's a pretty accurate statement. Uh, he would agree with you. Um, okay, so I will ask everybody in the chat room, is the chat room ready? And if the chat room is ready, they will say yes. Yes, Commander, I, we are ready. Yes, Commandant, yes, all clear. Uh, oh, Captain, my Captain, they say they're ready to go. Uh, yes, Zod. Yes, kneel before Zod. Um, you have 60 seconds. The clock is being set, and you will start your pitch in three Two, go. Jason, our education system is in a crisis. Did you know that we spend $25 billion each and every year for on-the-job training for teachers? Despite that fact, the top education official in the U.S., Secretary of Education Arne Duncan, recently said, and I quote, no area of the teaching profession is more plainly broken today than that of teacher professional development. This is a crisis because decades of research show that the most important factor in student achievement is teacher quality. It's just common sense, right? So my company is called There Now, and we have the solution to this crisis. We've developed a product called Iris Connect. It's the world's most advanced on-the-job training system for teachers. Iris Connect has two parts. The first part is an unobtrusive, portable, pan-tilt zoom camera and wireless microphone system that you place into any classroom. The second part is a web application that gives a remote observer a virtual window into that classroom through the hardware. 
The remote observer is a coach, a mentor, or even a colleague that's analyzing the video to provide immediate feedback to help that teacher improve. The observer can embed text, audio, and video feedback directly into the recorded observation. These videos and the feedback can then be shared through our web application. So Iris Connect is a bit like YouTube plus LinkedIn for teachers. Okay. Um, you finished in time. You did okay. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody in the chat room uh, the pitch and the idea. And I see pitch 9, idea 4. Pitch 3, idea 5, uh, 9 and 8. 7 uh, pitch, 7 pitch, 10 pitch, 9 idea, 3 idea, 5 idea, 8 idea, 7 idea, 4 idea. Uh, James, what did you think? I'm going to have to give it low ratings all around. And the big reason is, uh, where is this money coming from? Who's going to pay for this? Yeah. Uh, I guess that's the big poll in this. Uh, I just can't figure out, like, is it a government pays, or the teachers pays, or LA Unified pays, or the federal government pays? I mean, there's okay. no money in schools. Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, he did say this $25 market, but $25 billion market. Uh, however, uh, yeah, I, I, I had a question about that. And I, I would say I thought the pitch was pretty good, like a seven, and the idea maybe a six or seven, but I don't, I don't think I actually understand the idea. Um, I'm, you said it's LinkedIn, but then there was something about a webcam, and I don't know exactly what we're talking about here. Tyler, what, what, you give me your ideas. Um, scores? He, he, the, he, scores. The score, pitch, four, idea, could be an eight, nine. Okay. I, I, what is the idea in your mind? I want to hear what you took away from this. I what my, is the idea? I have my own idea for what he's doing. <laughs> I know, you, and you will have many insights. Yeah. What I'm asking you now is to explain back to him what he told you. Explain uh, his yeah. idea to him in plain English. He, his pitch was such that you can't really mm. reiterate back, and that's a good test of your pitch. Before, is, if is the, to say it to somebody and say, "What did I just say?" Yeah. <laughs> say what is my business? Right. Okay. People in the uh, chat room, uh, please explain in one sentence what this business um, there now is. Explain in one sentence. Can you explain, James, what this is in one sentence? The yeah. product itself? Yeah, it's uh, additional training and certification for teachers with, you know, some kind of mentor looking in on a webcam. But I still can't figure out who pays for it and okay. what the financial revenue model is. And interestingly enough, I'm just watching people here. Somebody says, big brother in the classroom, uh, remote coach watching uh, and assisting a teacher through training, camera in classroom to assist teachers, um, real-time training, making teachers better, training and Borgs. Uh, instant teacher feedback, no clue. Uh, people on the web will give feedback to teachers on their performance. Yes, obviously, we're going to, your, your idea is to webcast this to the open web and have anybody give feedback. Um, okay, so there you got some feedback, um, Sean. Uh, tell us one more time what the product is. That's question one. And the second question is, what, who pays? Take it well, in um, education researchers and practitioners have known for a long time, for like 30 or 40 years, the most effective way to train teachers, or really anybody for that matter, is through what's called cognitive apprenticeship. It's basically an apprenticeship where you, uh, someone models best practice, and then you try to perform that best practice, and they give you feedback about your performance. Now, this is going on in schools right now. It's just being done inefficiently and ineffectively because the expertise that's needed is so disparate, and the travel that's involved makes it very difficult to actually implement in that, uh, that in schools. Now, to uh, answer James's question about where's the money come from, there's a massive amount of money being spent on this problem. Uh, $25 billion is the size of the market. And uh, schools are already using coaching uh, models already. They're just doing it in a very inefficient and ineffective way. If we can give... Uh, 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 these coaches uh, a virtual window into classrooms so they can watch a teacher teach and provide them feedback that's immediate, that's contextualized. So I'm getting you feedback about your performance while you're actually in your classroom with your students. We have the most uh, effective means of coaching for teachers as available. So, you know, I guess one thing is I would imagine that right now in a time of heavy budget crisis where everybody's underwater, if you found a, an angle on this which was, uh, you know, schools are spending billions of dollars every year to train their teachers. We found a way to do it uh, for half the price. We can save them money and uh, improve effectiveness. 
that to me is a more compelling pitch than just, hey, you know, here's what this is. If you find a way to save the school's money, that's the angle I like. Or, but just well, improving teacher productivity alone, uh, I'm not so sure. Right, if you could save well, the money. So does it save money? And how much? It does save money uh, just in terms of efficiency, but also look at teacher attrition. In the past 15 years, teacher attrition has grown by 50%. Uh, a recent national study showed that the cost of that is about $25,000 per lost teacher. Okay. So you're saying this will uh, increase retention? It will increase retention okay. because teachers will have the support necessary to feel comfortable in their job. And we lose teachers oftentimes in their first year before Christmas. Okay. Because uh, they're unsupported. This is uh, a good idea. You have no website up. It's right now. It's a business plan and an idea, right? Have you tested no, this? No, no. Uh, we sold. Uh, we got 50 hours. Well, to, to, to this point, we've raised about 1.3 million dollars in grant funding from the Department of Education to Whoa. develop Hallelujah. and research the product. We've got wow. 50 irises around the world. I've got an iris. What's the uh, domain in name? Shanghai. Therenow.net. Therenow.net. Got it. Okay, so everybody go check out therenow.net. Everybody can uh, tweet today's callers, Babble Flicks, and Therenow, and tell them thank you for uh, participating in the program. And, um, okay, I see the iris there, and um, it's an interesting looking product. And um, we will. Uh, have, Scott Simcoe has some questions, so he's going to be following up with you for the blog. Thank you for calling in, Sean, and we look forward to uh, watching your growth and success. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Cheers, man. Good job. Two good callers today. Yeah, uh, totally actually, different businesses. He might want to mention the fact that I got a billion dollar grant. <laughs> like, I think a million, right? Million yeah. three, yeah. And, and that he actually has a physical product, Yeah. Um, which is interesting. Uh, so, uh, great job, uh, everybody, on that. and. The other person doing a great job right now is, of course, our friends at WebSpy. Uh, just got news that they have re-upped their sponsorship. They're going to be with us, um, I think, through the rest of the year or something insane. Uh, they love the show. And, uh, of course, WebSpy monitors everything going on on your network. And uh, this lets you maximize productivity and reduce costs. And it's a total log analyst, uh, analysis, analysis solution. Uh, from mail servers to web hosts, you want to look at the traffic levels and patterns and errors on your network. It's a very important thing to do. And uh, also for compliance and stuff like that if you're one of those bigger companies. And I've told you all these stories before. People do stupid things when they're at work. And uh, you've got great employees who might uh, do something dumb on the network. And you can at least know that somebody's doing something stupid and say, hey, don't do something stupid on the network. WebSpy, WebSpy, they're a great company. Go check out WebSpy.com, and um, you just tell them that your Uncle Jason sent you. We have a lot of sponsors on the show. That's good. It's good to have sponsors. I'll tell you why. The show is very sustainable, hmm. and I can't miss an episode of the show now. We have to take the show very seriously now because... Have you been missing episodes? No, but when we did Calacanis Cast, it was like, yeah, we'll do one when we feel like it. That was like sort of like a couple of years ago we did Calacanis Cast. It was just me and Tyler, you know riffing and stuff like that, just in a room with two microphones. You know, when the whole podcast thing started. But now we have three employees mm. working on the show. You have Emily and Kenny, and Emily's doing all the production work, and Kenny is doing all the editing and stuff, and then you have Natasha, who is a social media ninja, and she's talking to everybody in the chat room. Then we got Scott Simcoe. I mean, we got a lot of mouths to feed. Mm. If we miss a show, four sponsors don't run. That's a lot of cheddar. Plus disappointed audience. People Plus a disappointed audience. Right. Then I can't pay their salaries. Then they can't pay their rent. I mean, it's the whole, that's how the whole United States got in this trouble in the beginning with. They move in, they're going to move in with you. That's what's going to happen. No, they're not moving. I already have somebody. I got Josh Harris living in my pool house. That's enough. Uh, James, um, Edgecast has been doing great. You're a local startup here. Hmm. Um, tell everybody, what is Edgecast? And uh, how did you get the idea to start this? And, and where is the company at now? Sure. So uh, we are a content delivery network. Basically, we make websites run faster. Uh, we power Mahalo and about 1,200 other websites. Uh, and if it weren't for CDNs or content delivery networks like ours, uh, the, the Internet would simply stop working. Uh, we're really uh, sort of propping it up now. You think about the volume of users on the Internet, the uh, this 
broadband penetration is, I think, what, something like 80% in North America, and it's you know, growing all over the world. Everyone is depending on the web for almost every kind of communication. And what uh, content delivery networks do is we keep copies of websites in storage caches or storage uh, locations closer to end users, very well connected. So we've got you know, big pipes into all the big networks. And we make sure those websites load faster. And we do that for video streaming, for downloads, for podcasts, for website acceleration. And uh, we are just a, a big infrastructure provider for the web. Yeah. Now, why um, does the web need this exactly? Like, you know, people have servers. People think, gosh, the, the, the Internet is designed so well. Mm. You have a server here. You connect to it over all these fiber optic lines. Why do you need to take the data from one server and put it in 50 places? And when did this whole concept of CDNs, Content Delivery Networks, start? Sure. So, I mean, the big, the big gorilla in this space is Akamai. They started this, sure. gosh, uh, a little bit more than 15 years ago. And... Uh, what happened was is that all, if you think of all the uh, the web uh, internets out where the net sorry the networks out there uh, they were really poorly interconnected so you used to have prodigy and AOL dial up and, and you had all these different little ISPs that were bringing people online and they didn't all sort of overlap well so you think you had a spider web here and a spider web here and a spider web here and at some point these ISPs all consolidate and get bought by bigger telcos and they have to find a way to work together and what happens is if you have a data, a piece of data that needs to go from New York to Los Angeles, it doesn't go in a straight line. It goes in a very, you know, crazy route all over the place to different routers and networks and hops. And so it takes a long time to get there. We've all come to expect really, really fast page load times. And so in order for that to happen, there's no way with both the combination of the speed of light and with the interconnectivity of networks for that piece of data to get all the way across the U.S. in time. So all you've got to do is you take that piece of data and you keep a copy of it on the other side of the world. That way, the first time you request a page, the content loads right away. And this is what Google has done particularly well with things like Gmail and YouTube. Yep. They keep copies of you know, popular YouTube videos exactly. really close to your house. Yep. How close is it to your house in, in, in that sense? Like, you live in a major city like Los Angeles or New York, and I'm looking at you know, the most popular video of all time on YouTube. We mm. assume it is cached around the world. And if, you know, you're in some city. Where is that server? How close is it to you? Well, there's two ways to think about close. There's physically close, and then right. there's network proximity. Ah. Network proximity is measured in milliseconds. So how long does it take the content to get to your computer? Mm -hmm. So you want to be, you know, less than a second away. You want to be maybe 80 milliseconds away. And that's sort of the refresh time that your mind needs in order to see content load really fast. Hmm. Uh, physically, 80 milliseconds could take uh, 100 miles, or it could take 10 miles to travel, really depending on the congestion on the Internet. Ah. So, for instance, we're here in L.A., we're in Santa Monica. Our pop is downtown. Right. And that services all of L.A. County and actually a lot of Southern California perfectly. No right. problems there. And you said the word pop? Oh, sorry, our point of presence. Your point uh, of presence. data center. Where the server is. Exactly, yes. Uh, and so... Uh, why did you decide to start? You started this company, I think, two or three years ago. August of '06, yeah. So, you and at that point, I remember because we were doing Weblogs Inc. and we were doing some podcasting, and there was this whole thing with CDN wars. Mm. CDNs were charging, I don't know, a dollar. What did they charge by gigabyte or something? Yeah. So charging, you know, fifty cents a gigabyte or seventy-five cents a gigabyte, and then all I remember at Weblogs Inc. was everybody calling like, you know, oh, it's eighty cents. Oh no, it's seventy cents, fifty cents, you know, forty cents. It was like this race to the bottom, yeah. and everybody talking about. You know, like, this is the worst business you could possibly be in. It's been mm. commoditized. Mm. And Akamai is the 800-pound gorilla. Yep. And they can beat anybody up. And then you guys decide in the 2006 you're going to start something. Why? What well, was the unique value proposition that said, I'm going to go compete with the 800-pound gorilla? So uh, we had this idea for a website. So my partners and I, this is our third company together. And so uh, we had sold the last one. We had worked for the company that bought us for a year. And then we sort of said, all right, we want to start something else. And uh, we all sat down in a room and said, what are we going to do? And we came up with an idea for a video site. Uh, forget what the idea was. We thought at the time it was the greatest thing. And so we said, well, we're going to be huge, right? We need a CDN. So we started calling up Akamai. We called them a, basically every day for two weeks. They didn't call us back. Yeah, I've had that experience, actually. And, you know, when you have 90,000 Twitter followers and you say, my God, I am sick and tired of dealing with Akamai, mm. um, the Akamai CEO finds out. Yeah. And the person who's a salesperson looks really stupid. Yeah. So if you're a salesperson out there at a, at a technology company, can I explain something to you? If you ignore clients, you are extremely stupid because the CEO will find out, and when they do, they will hit the roof. I, if somebody told me that one of our salespeople did not return a call in the same day, I mean, 48 hours... Sec next day would be the absolute limit. If I found out there were two days and somebody didn't call back, three days, 
I would fire the salesperson immediately. I, it would not even be a discussion, unless like their dog died or they, you know, something would have to have happened. But to not call somebody back is insane. Well, I think that's the difference between entrepreneurs and enormous Fortune 500 institutions. Right. They have an institutionalized approach there, which is, hey, we're this huge company. We deal with the biggest of the biggest websites. Right. So if you're a tiny little website, a startup entrepreneur who's right. got nothing material at this point but knows he's going to have something, right. and you're a salesperson, you have to choose your time to talk to this entrepreneur who's going to you know, maybe spend a couple hundred bucks a month, or talk to that big account, MTV or Viacom right. or whoever, you're going to spend your time on the big account. I totally agree with you. I mean, if any single one of my salesperson didn't call somebody back right away, it'd be, you know, Hell they'd, to pay for it. they'd be out the door. Yeah. But you sort of see what happens. When a company gets that big and they're that focused on, you know, the Fortune 500, you understand how that can happen. But to your point, I, I don't, don't think... understand. I tell you, I still don't understand it because the little companies mm. become successful right. and become big companies. Yeah, I'm with you. And if you ignore clients and you build a culture of that, I mean, it... It is just like d just throwing your entire business away. It would be like, you know, McDonald's serves a lot of people, sure. you know, and but everybody gets their food, you know, just as fast. Or, or, or pick any restaurant chain, TGI Fridays. I mean, it costs nothing to just email the person back and say, I am slammed with a thing. Can I get back to you in 48 hours? Just that little thing. Uh, listen, 48 hours would have been amazing. No, it, it's more like, you know, they don't get back to you for months. And that's uh, even if the lead comes in to a salesperson because it has to go through some you know, right. crazy route in order to get to someone. It gets vetted by a call center in India. It took me three or four days of tweeting yeah. how pissed off I was to get somebody to call me back. Yeah. Finally, what happened was my friend who sold his company to Akamai emailed the CEO mm -hmm. and said, what is going on? I sold you my company and you're ignoring... Jason, uh, uh, and he said like five times, does nobody even watch the word Akamai on Twitter? Yeah. And how we, could you not return his call? It makes no sense. Like, he wants to pay money. So anyway, you had the same experience I had, which is Akamai is a disaster. Yeah, we had that same experience with Akamai, with Limelight, with uh, at the yeah. time Vitalstream, which became Internap. We couldn't get anybody to return a call. So that was a huge indicator. As an entrepreneur, when you see a space that hot, when somebody can't take the time to call you back and take your money, I'm like sitting there waiting to give them my, my right. clams, right? And uh, I'm just like, wow, this is crazy. What are we doing with this video website? We can't figure out how to make money here. Right. Let's turn this around and be, go back in infrastructure. Yeah. We, we were in web hosting before, so we really felt good about that. And to your point, we looked at the space and we said, this is a commoditizing space. It's highly competitive. What, you know, what can we do to make it different? And I'm telling you, it was the most basic uh, business sort of solution. We took Web 2.0 technology, the ability to actually go log into a web control panel, click a button, and provision an account, something that we assume we do all day. You do it all day long with a Gmail account sure. or anything, right? By provision, you mean sign up. To sign up, to set up. To turn on. Yes, to yes. enable, to empower. To, yes, exactly. So uh, that idea is something that the CDN space just hadn't seen. Everything in the CDN space was like a, a telco. Right. You wanted to get something done, you had a fax yeah, and order be in. a backhoe, you got to call the guy, we're going to schedule weeks something. Six contract negotiation, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then the cable guy shows up between four and eight, you know? It, it was crazy. And so we were able to literally just apply standard Web 2.0 practice to a very mature industry. And that alone made us the most modern CDN This is a very important point you're bringing up. I'm glad you're bringing it up. Because if you make things difficult for your customers, mm. they will hate you. And if you make it smooth and easy, they will spend more time and money with you and love exactly. you. Yeah. And I'm not going to harp on Akamai too much here because I don't want to beat them up. But the craziest thing about that was it's like there's a price that this stuff costs. We finally get the salesperson. We negotiate with them. We get a contract. He doesn't call us back. Weeks later, we finally get in touch with them. We're like, we're ready to do something maybe. And he's like, yeah, okay, well, let's get a contract. Like, we have the contract you sent. Punchline? That contract's no longer valid. <laughs> we have to start over. Okay, what needs to change? Oh, everything's got to change, and I'm going to call you back. And the whole thing, I remember, I went crazy. And I thought it was my people. So I'm going crazy on my people. What are you, what, you guys can't just order something? I mean, I can go to the store and get a thing of milk, and I go crazy on my people about it. Mm. The reason Google has done so well, isn't it because it's so self-serve? It's that easy. People don't want to talk to a salesperson. People hate salespeople. I mean, you think about how hard it is to set up an exchange server to get your email running for your company, right? Sure. We use Google Apps. We use Google Mail, right, for our company. Mm. It took me to go set it up. Yes. It took me five minutes, and I was done, and I had set up email addresses for 25 employees. Yes. Right when we, this was yes. three years ago. Yes. And, uh, 
it, it's just too easy, too easy. Now, you raised money for the company, a yep. couple of rounds. Who are the investors? So Steamboat Ventures is the uh, sort of investment affiliate venture affiliate of the Walt Disney Company. Ah. And they invested in the company in uh, fall of 07. Ah. And before that, you know, all the first millions of bucks was mine and my partners. And we built, uh, we built the company really with a couple of angels as well. Yeah. And uh, we are actually a very well capitalized company, but uh, sort of undercapitalized compared to our competitors. We've, we raised less than about 10 million. Yeah, got a yeah. few million of uh, debt financing from uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Yep. And we were able to make a profitable company that is the number three ranked CDN in the space with over 1,200 customers. And uh, Akamai and Edgecast are the only two profitable CDNs in a, I think there's 40 CDNs out there in the marketplace right. today. Why are there so many? Why did so many people go into this business? It, it, it doesn't make sense to me that there's 40 of them. Yeah. Why, why don't they? some of them go out of business? Uh, a lot of them have gone out of business. Ah, so there is, but there has been a shakeout. There's been a shakeout. There's been consolidation. There's been attrition. Uh, there's a company called Panther Express that blew, blew through like 20 or 30 million bucks of venture capital in two years. Yeah, Kevin, a friend of mine, Kevin Ryan, did that, and yep. he was doing Gawker's stuff. And what, they just unplugged it, or is it still going? Or? Uh, they sort of sold out the assets to ah. CD Networks, which is a CDN out of Korea. Ah. Which, yeah. And so there's some well-financed guys in the space. Uh, to answer your point, the main drivers, I think, have been video. So video has driven the bandwidth consumption on the Internet uh, phenomenally. If you right. think of, uh, this is something interesting to do. There's a, are you familiar with the concept of a peering point or an exchange, peering exchange? Peering exchange. Now, I think I do. Let me see if I get it right. This is where you put a server like on Verizon's network or Time Warner's network so that you get closer to the Time Warner users? Sort of. And so what happens is if you think of this Verizon, AT&T, MC, all the various sure. uh, carriers, they need to find places where they interconnect. If you think of it like a freeway, it's just the exchange point. Oh, where they I all see. Connect. Okay. So where Verizon connects to AT&T connects to Time Warner. Exactly. And uh, there's sort of centralized points. You've probably heard of May East and May West. Uh, those I have. Are, what is that? Those are actually sort of when, the, I guess, the uh, military originally sort of started the basic internet, internet backbone. ARPANET. Yes. Those were the primary uh, congestion or exchange points where the internet sort of interconnected. And those are proliferated. And so now what you have is maybe, you know, 15 of these locations in North America, you know, 10 of these locations in Europe, and, and, and additional locations around the world. And so uh, these are where uh, everyone sort of interconnects. And if you take a look at, uh, some of these are public exchange points. Some of them are like uh, uh, public orgs. Uh, there's one called Am Am Amix, uh, Amsix, and there's another called DKIX. Uh, one's in Amsterdam, one's in Germany, one's Lynx in London. Uh, one these, are these are hubs. It's sort of like hubs. LAX or yes, something. Yes, yes. It's sort of where all the air traffic controllers get together yeah, yeah. and they sort of, you know. And it's yeah. public, like it's like a utility or something. Like, some of them like are, the internet. are private, would yeah. take a little money. Some of them are public, yes. Right. Uh, so if you look at the Amsterdam Exchange, which is one of the central hubs in Europe, uh, uh, if you look at the volume of traffic that just goes across that exchange over the last year, January 1st, 2009 to January 1st, 2010, the total volume of traffic has doubled. So if you think it took 20 years for the Internet to get as big as it got by January 1st, 2009, right. and then literally in 12 months, the entire volume of traffic across the Internet doubled. Right. That is pretty, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Right. right. And how much of YouTube... Um, turning on like HD and stuff like that. Will that is it literally like YouTube turns on HD and like the internet gets ten percent? It is. It is a, a number of percent goes up when the internet uh, when YouTube does something. So, um, why hasn't the internet slowed down? Slowed down. I mean, people keep saying. I, I hear Mark Cuban say like on his blog like the internet can't handle you know HD streaming. He's been saying for a long time and this you know it's the whole thing's going to come to a crawl. Yet it seems that you know there's 500 people watching us right now live streaming. It's pretty mm -hmm. good quality, and it's uh, people will download this, and you know they'll download maybe 700 megabytes, and mm. there'll be 25,000 downloads of the show a week from now. What? Why isn't the internet slowing down? So uh, the reason is the internet is ready to scale to about 5x. So at huh. any given point, we've got some headroom. And there's a decent amount of headroom. And we're still riding the wave from the dot-com bubble investment when all these uh, billions of dollars went into carrier infrastructure and fiber and all that stuff. Right. But 5x, when you think about you know, a year-on-year -year growth of 2x, it's not going to take long to eat that, three years. eat that up. Basically, three years. And so if you think Because it's compounding for those people who didn't understand. It's not five Indeed. years because this year doubles. It goes you know, from two to four and then four to eight. Exactly. It's going to get eaten up quick. And so when you think about the fact that IPTV hasn't really hit yet and it's going to... Internet uh, protocol television. Yes. Got it. Uh, and that concept of TV everywhere where you can watch a TV show on your uh, laptop and you can watch it on the TV at home and then you can watch it on your mobile device. Which I have with Ustream, but most people don't have. Uh, not Ustream. I have it with... Um, 
Slingbox. I can watch it on my iPhone. I can watch it on my laptop. Exactly. But that's going to be available to everybody? That, within the next three years, every, uh, so Vizio just launched during the Super Bowl. They talked about how now you can get internet access to your TV and all your favorite shows. I have that on my TV, yeah. But it doesn't do the TV show. Well, it will. Yeah. It, it basically, it's going to be connecting the internet directly into your TV, connecting the internet so you, directly you into you plug your ethernet into your TV. And you're done. And you have Netflix on demand in your TV. Netflix on demand, every Hulu. satellite program you ever wanted, every, you can navigate the web. And, and this is going to go over the internet? This is going to go over the internet. Can the internet, if all Americans all of a sudden today, if, I don't know, 20 million Americans watched Lost uh, over an internet connection today, would You're, the internet be able to handle it? Absolutely not. No way. 10 million? Uh, no. 5 million? No, because it's on a single provider. So um, oh, I see. It, it needs to be much better distributed. So we're not ready for IPTV at all. At least not in HD quality with a large number of people doing it. Right, but luckily... So Mark Cuban is correct. This is not going to just all of a sudden work itself out. Well, there are vendors like us and right. who are sort of the band-aid to, in the short term, allow this to happen right. because of the caching and streaming technology we offer. And then in the meantime, the tel telcos are figuring out where they're going to get the money to invest in additional infrastructure. Right. So they're deploying caching servers in their own networks to try to push uh, oh, really? out the content. Oh, yeah. So the AT&Ts and the Time Warners are going to have CDNs of their own and cache stuff? They have internal CDNs, and it's, the concept is called a transparent cache, where what they do is they take popular content that's on their network, and they just take that popular content, and they keep copies of it at the edge of their network, so they don't have to use the backhaul to carry it across So country. if somebody's loading a Mahalo page, you know, like we have a page today that's being loaded a lot, like Olympic opening ceremonies, and are you telling me that if we change that page and it's at the edge of... Time Warner, it's not going to be changed for Time Warner users? No, it gets changed. Oh, so they know how to time it out or something? Right. So when you think about how a web server works, right. uh, it reads the HTTP headers, uh -huh. and it's HTTP compliant. So whatever the header tells it to do, it does. Ah. And so you can really never worry about uh, your old content being on there. The, the main issue is making sure that uh, you know, you're using a CDN and making sure that everybody else is using a CDN. Now, what happened to this multicast technology? I remember back in the day, people said, oh, my God, you can never stream over the Internet. This, I'm talking 98, 99. So this is not going to work. There's mm -hmm. not enough bandwidth for every single person to be selfish and do streaming video. Of course, Ustream is working today. Right. But they said very clearly Ustream would not work because there wouldn't be enough servers, the servers would crash. If you did video serving like on a real player, I mean, you'd get like 32 people per server or something like that. When Sudo and Josh Harris were doing it, it was like he had 20 servers and you could get like, I think it was 32 people on each one or something insanely small. Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah, it's, the protocols have changed. Yeah. So you don't have to use real server. You can, right. you, know, you can use all these different other technologies. Now, what about the concept of having multicasting or, you know, like the the Olympics are streaming over the entire network and your computer just taps into that one stream mm -hmm. live as opposed to we each grab it from the, a server and get a de dedicated connection going down. Is that kind of multi, is it called multicast? Is that the correct way to say it? Yeah, when it's done over the ISP or over the carrier, it's multicast. Ah. Uh, but that's, that's not what an over-the-top over provider like us, uh, like we, we use. Right, so if we don't control the actual network ourselves. Right. We're not able to do multicast. Right. Uh, we're just doing... Does multicast exist today? Or? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a protocol that's used within carrier infrastructure. So when would I use that? When I look at CNN or something? Uh, actually, if you're going to like yeah, ESPN 360 and you're uh -huh. on network and that's something that, let's say, a service provider like Verizon's offering dedicated, mm. they could use multicast for that. Got it. Interesting. Uh, and China blocking a lot of things. Mm. Iraq, no, Iran blocking Gmail. Uh, how, I mean, people consider the Internet America. We still control it with ICANN, I guess. To a certain extent, we have a lot of influence over the internet. Certainly, um, I mean, we created it. In fairness, mm. is that is that fair to say that we created it? Well, we've dominated it. I don't, whether, yeah, I think it's a. Yeah. So whatever. Either we created or we dominated it. So either way, it's ours. Uh, no, not really. But um, what what's going to happen as these countries want to control their internet? Is this sustainable? Or you know, we have these attacks coming. What, what do you think is going to happen with China and Iran? Are we going to like? technically like build some kind of like wall between those countries and they have firewalls on their side are we gonna have to put firewalls on our side that anything coming from those places gets checked for bad actors uh is this overblown is the next world war gonna start because of china hackers fighting with you know big multinational corporations in the united states what's well, your take on it I mean, you, you got a good point there. So the Internet is based on fairly open protocols. 
And so uh, ISPs, carriers who work around the world, and there's you know, local carriers in each country, they all talk to each other. And the idea of having an IP address that's you know, broadcasting a signal and says, OK, I resolve a domain name, a URL, to a, a number, 1.1.1.1, that IP address, all of that relies on a certain openness and logic. And what can happen is there can be sort of uh, malicious people out there who will you know, steal addresses or move traffic around. Uh, and so what happened uh, uh, maybe about six or 12 months ago is uh, somebody, and I think it was maybe in Iran, uh, at a big ISP, typed something into a router incorrectly and basically blocked like, a ton of uh, internet addresses. And what happened is, is that propagated wow. all around the world and a whole bunch of content was unavailable simply because of the human error. Whoa. So you can say that, yes, certain countries can choose to do things. You can also just have malicious things happen. And we are all so integrated on the Internet that there's a ton of exposure. Do you think if China or other hackers uh, wanted to, and they had a lot of resources, which obviously in China they seem to have a ton of resources, sure. would they be able to shut down the American Internet or you know, disturb it significantly that it would be unusable? Is I that scenario possible? I don't think hackers necessarily could do it, but I certainly think if the government put their mind to it, they could find a way to disrupt things. Uh, but it's not in their best interest to do that, so I can't right. see that happening. They love having tight control over their constituents within their country, right? And that's fine. But they don't tend to, you know, right. go out and take. But if there was some a, huge war, I mean, going on, or some big debate over debt or something like that, uh, this sort of World War III scenario where they could make it impossible for Americans to use the internet or flood it with traffic or you know shut servers down denial servers whatever I mean it's technically possible it is technically possible so I mean if you go unlikely but possible right so uh, you know w one person you should get on here is some of the the chief technology people at the White House ah and they think a lot about this do they know what they're doing I think Honestly. the chief technology people probably do okay because I always wonder like I mean I know you know what you're talking about I know your people in your company do mm. but does, a go does our government even know like when this stuff happens like the when the Gmail attack happened. Well, they've hired guys like you and me who ah, just see. come out of private industry and went and, okay. you know, do their public service years. So when those guys, the technical people there, and mm. don't give me a political answer here, but the technical people there, are they as good as the people in private? Like, they're going to be as good as Google engineers? Like, they are former Google engineers. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Well, then that makes me feel a little bit better. Yeah. So you don't think that the, the government is incapable or incompetent in terms of protecting the country on the Internet? No, no, not at all. They're capable. Right. And I think, you know, they also have to look at... That makes at me feel better, because I've always wondered about that. Well, you have to think about it. If you're like, I don't know, the White House, and you need to provide secure telecommunications and secure operations communication, right. you want to make, yeah. make sure that your network doesn't go down. Right. And they all depend on the Internet. And if they're depending on the open Internet, well, yeah. you don't want that to happen. So I think that there's a lot of folks out there who've thought about different ways to protect uh, and to close off networks. Right. And that can apply to a specific closed network like a government network, but that can also extend to a national network. Net neutrality. Mm. We saw Google's going to do 500 connections, 50,000 or 500,000 homes in fiber, possibly. Uh, the carriers want to charge different prices for different types of traffic. They want to maybe charge the people like Mahalo or Google a fee for sending the traffic. What, what's your stance on net neutrality and how big of an issue is this? So I have a pretty strong opinion about this, and it Good. might be a little bit different than yours. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that uh, the fallacy that the Internet is free and that everything you get on the Internet should be free right. is uh, soon to come to an end. Uh, it's just not possible for everything to be free. Uh, answers shouldn't be free. Uh, content shouldn't be free. Uh, there's a commerce model associated with everything. Maybe it's uh, advertising generated or maybe it's subscription, whatever it is. I believe that uh, the access provider is going to be the key to generating revenue on the Internet. So it's going to be the people that give you access to the Internet, physical access, the ability to log on with your iMac, the ability to get online uh, with a dial-up at your home that will be capturing the revenue, and they will pass that money up. So they'll pass it back to the movie company or to the music company or to the website owner or to um, Google because you're using their you know, email service. So that's what you think is going to happen. They're going to charge people for service? That I think there's going to be a revenue share all the way down because when you think of... Yeah, really? Yeah. And if you talk to most of the carriers, they're all, they are all working on deals like this where they're trying to figure out how to pay for the enormous investment in infrastructure to support everybody's well, great idea. Well, aren't they idea. charging people? To, for this access? Like they charge me for access at home. Yeah, but they're underwater on that. They're no, they make oh. billions of dollars, these companies. They're so underwater on local access, it's crazy. 
Really? Yeah, especially for a super user like you. They priced that thinking that maybe you'd be using it one-tenth of what you're using it. I can guarantee they're underwater on your day. No, but oh, on average, these companies are posting record profits. How could they be underwater? I don't understand. The, on local, on sort of local uh, internet access, yeah. they don't make much money. Hmm. Yeah, especially as the trend increases where you've got these super users that are just congesting. And so network. Google saying we're going to put fiber to these homes mm -hmm. is what? Honestly, I, I have no idea what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they've got... It's a little confusing. Yeah. But, you know, they started a whole lot of different businesses that are confusing, right? They got into print ads for a while. They got into billboard ads for a while. I think they like to explore and experiment, and right. they learn something from it. You know? Uh, you know, Big Brother gets stronger every time he figures something out. You mentioned before that you uh, raised $10 million or something, yep. and that you also had a loan or, cre uh, you know, a line of credit with sure. Silicon Valley Bank. Yes. Uh, as an entrepreneur... Why would you do that instead of raising capital? Obviously, you can raise a bunch of capital uh, pretty easily since you're a seasoned entrepreneur. And how does it work? Is it is it like venture capital, this loan, or is it something that, I mean, I know, but I'm asking for the audience. Sure. So, so there's explain different... What that, explain what that is. So when you think just from a basic financial model perspective, uh, debt is always cheaper than equity because mm -hmm. you don't actually have to give up part of your company. No shares. You, no shares. You just borrow money from someone and then you pay them an interest rate back. And if you have a business that generates a certain revenue and a certain profit and you have a cash flow, you can afford to pay your interest payments and therefore you can afford to borrow against that revenue stream. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a business like ours, which is a recurring revenue model that spits off good cash, and that needs a lot of capex, a lot of capital, servers, hardware, routers. Uh, you can finance the acquisition of that hardware and use debt to do that. So we borrow money to build servers and buy servers, and then we pay off that server loan uh, back to the bank at a certain interest rate. And ah. that is a much uh, better access to you know, capital for us. Is it? And so they have they get no kind of warrants or, or There's stock. There's some warrant coverage, sure. Warrant coverage means what? Oh, so, uh, We're trying to educate entrepreneurs here. Sure, so. no, no worries, no worries. So uh, a bank like Silicon Valley Bank is very entrepreneurial friendly, works with a lot of tech startups, and part of their business model is to bet on the uh, company to win. And so they also want a little taste. They want some stock. They want the to get a taste. They want a taste. And you so got to give them the VIG. They give them the VIG. Yeah. So they want some stock options? Uh, yeah, so they're warrants, which are basically options that are exercisable, uh, and they get some stock for loaning you the money. So... Would this be 1% of your shares, half a point, or a quarter point? What do you think, it, not in your case, but in general, what would, what would Silicon Valley ba want to own? Is it, is it just a number based on, how, how do they come to that number? Sure. Uh, it's a risk profile. It depends who's invested in the company. So yeah. obviously, they're going to want a bigger piece if it's a higher risk. Ah. And if it's a lower risk, they'll take a smaller piece. So Disney's an investor. They don't, you know, they, they, I think Disney's probably good for it. I'm pretty sure they are. Why did Disney invest in your business? Well, so to be specific, it wasn't Disney. Rather, right. it was their venture capital arm. Right. Uh, and these, uh, these folks really took a look at what Disney does as a company, and a lot of it's moving online. Yeah. Uh, online is a marketing channel for them, for all their movies, TV shows, and properties, as well as now a source of you know, audience. Mm. Uh, and so being able to uh, really get a piece of an infrastructure company that was powering the growth of media, yeah. we're the only company like ours in Los Angeles here in Hollywood, right. uh, would just make total sense to them. I agree. Let's bring in Lon to do the news. Uh, Lon, are you here with your news? Super wow. That's Lon. Very serious. Very serious. Da, da, da. Yes. Hi, Lon. Hey, Why did Di so. Disney sell blank? URL removed. I don't know what they're talking about in the chat room. Um, Okay, so uh, in this part of the program, uh, we uh, look at the week's news stories. We give you the honest assessment of what's going on. And I can tell you clearly my honest assessment, if you're going to uh, get some servers for your startup company, is that you should check out PowerVPS.com. That's a pretty good one. I think that's the best segue on the show into an ad. Uh, PowerVPS.com, uh, virtual and dedicated web hosting. You get a 30-day money-back guarantee. It grows while you grow. Control packages. You know you can control all your stuff from, um, you know, a remote control of the server. You don't need to go buy a bunch of servers, especially not when you're starting up. God forbid you spend your money on that. Uh, and it starts as low as $59 a month. What and a twist, deal! It's a deal. And Twist viewers, uh, thank you for the enthusiasm. Uh, Twist viewers get 25% off for life if they use the code Twist. Yes. And it is your Geary, it is your humble, humble honor 
to thank the sponsors, thank at Bing, thank at DNA Mail, thank at WebSpy, and thank at Power VPS, and thank at Ustream TV. All of the great sponsors of the show, all with us for a long time, and hopefully a long time to come. Lon, it was a busy week. It was a, it was a crazy week, actually. More, more news this week, I think, maybe any other week. Great. I've been working here. So we'll have four hours of show today. Yes, it'll go a little long. Uh, obviously, first up, Google Buzz. Google went social this week with the release of Google Buzz, an expansion of Gmail that marries the threaded conversation format with all kinds of interactions you would usually do on social sites like Facebook or Twitter. Jason, one of your first posts on Buzz claimed that the service had cut Facebook's value in half. And yes. you later provided a list of features Twitter must introduce in order to compete. A few days in, are you still as bullish? I am absolutely bullish on this product. It is incredibly well executed, and I will go through why. Uh, number one, it's faster than Twitter and Facebook. Those two products are dogs. They're slow. Uh, they freeze up a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, 50 seconds to log into Facebook. We've all experienced that. Um, it is um, very feature rich. And everybody who's involved in your email box is, by definition, pretty high quality and related to you. So when I post to Buzz, the first day I had 2,000 people. Mm -hmm. By the second day, I had 4,000 people, and I just saw that I'm the number... I think you're number five right now. I'm number five with 4,500 yeah. viewers. Uh, and when I give away a, you know, a, a Tesla Model S for being number one, then I'll, <laughs> I'll definitely be number one. Um, anyway, uh, so many people following me, and I would post something and get 100 likes and 250 comments. I have never seen in a social network intelligent, uh, real comments at that pace ever ever it yeah. makes facebook look like a ghost town facebook has 400 million people and it looks like a ghost town compared to buzz now buzz there are criticisms maybe this product should not be integrated with your um with gmail email yes the people might like it yeah. yes and then there are, but the privacy concerns are a little bit overblown like people are sort of saying like it's exposing your own email box that's not actually true uh, and you can put your thing on private. So there are tools, but in fairness to them, and I don't want to, I'm not like, I am a Google fanboy. I, I do like their products. I think they're well done. Uh, and the price is always right with Google, free. Um, <laughs> but within 24 hours, they addressed the privacy issues and started mm -hmm. fixing things. Facebook waits until they have 10 lawsuits to fix anything. Uh, James, have you played with it? No. OK. Tyler? Yeah, I played with it. I, I think it's interesting from within Google's own perspective because now they're going to have access to a lot of this data that they can then leverage in their search results. Wait, wait, say it again. I'm saying Google was sort of at the whim of Twitter. Right. It had all of this real-time data flowing through their system. OK. And they had to buy a line into it. Right. Now they're going to have their own sort of database of flourishing updates and everything that they can then push into their search results if they ah, want to start doing some This work. is a quality insight. Insight from Tyler. You know, last week was a zero insight episode, and people yeah, are going The first, crazy. the first the ever. The first, and people are going crazy. Insight free episode. Tyler, you should like to give a couple of insights. But it's a very good insight, because they're paying for the feed. Now they no longer have to pay for the feed. And um, yeah, it, well, it's is significant. That, is that, I mean, there is nothing in Google Buzz to indicate that this is going to be something they're going to push into search engines. I mean, would that be another concern? Like, no, they don't have to push the search engine. But if they see that this video or this blog post about, if, if there's five blog posts about the uh, luge. Right, the Olympic The luge Olympic luger who athlete, died, yes. which is so sad. And I have a whole bunch of comments on that. It's a side thing. Right. Which if we ever do Jason Nation and just talk about other stuff outside of technology, mm -hmm. I would go off on. But um, that, which five links are getting the most comments on them and are retweeted the most or rebuzzed, mm -hmm. whatever rebuzzed, or liked? Just that would be the order they should come up in Google News. If people have commented on that and they have voted yeah. it up, ergo, it's the better one. Right. With, with few exceptions. They're getting, the, the algorithm just got a hell of a lot smarter in a social right. sense. Yeah. Correct, Tyler. This is the big insight. Yeah. And this is correct. Um, this product will 
um, devalue, and, and the real purpose of this on a gangster level mm -hmm. is Facebook is about to announce, and this is another one of these things that I say on the show that nobody knows, that somebody could make into a big story. Um, but you know, the journalists don't seem to want to give me credit for all the insights we have on the show. But Facebook is working on Facebook Sense, basically their version of AdSense. It is not only going to exist on Facebook, it is going to be available on sites that have Facebook Connect. Right. So on Mahalo Answers, instead of putting Google AdSense, we could put Facebook Sense. When they build their big ad network, they will know not only the keywords associated with that page, they will know all this information about the person. Mm -hmm. Because they have behavioral data. So they will know that Tyler has been in Japan, has 20 friends in Japan. Yeah. And so when Tyler is doing a search on an airline or, or, or something, they could include that data in the search result and in the, in the ads, rather. Hmm. So if, he's gonna, if they're going to show a cookbook, they might as well show a Japanese cookbook to him because that's his second biggest network. Right. You get the idea. Yes. And this is a huge threat to Google. So what does Google do? They commodify, commoditize it. They make it free and available here in Google, uh, in Gmail. Just like Google tries to commoditize Google, uh, Microsoft Word and Microsoft Office and mi even Microsoft's browser mm -hmm. and Microsoft's operating system. Just like Apple, you know, everybody's trying to co commoditize the other thing that the person has that makes their money. Yes. Google Android is meant to cut, is meant to ankle. Let's just use the word that is accurate. Kneecap. You understand what I mean? I do. Take, take out the other guy. Galooly Nancy them. Kerrigan. Galooly them, yeah. Galooly them. Thank you. Good reference. So yeah. they're kneecap and galooly of these people. And that's what the, the explicit purpose, implicit, sumplicit, complicit. It would be implicit. It would be implicit. Because Thank they're you. not explicitly saying no, we're going to mess with Facebook, right? Yes, it's implicit. But inside those meetings, it's explicit is they want to cut the most profitable thing at Apple, the iPhone, mm -hmm. by commoditizing it, make it free. Lower prices, more competitors. It is, we were talking at the, at the TED conference last night at the dinner and at the poker game about how there has net, I was talking with Tim O'Reilly, mm -hmm. and he was saying he, he can't believe the level of combativeness between the companies and everybody going for everything. Who, who would ever think Google would go into the, um, you know, the, the social space and the phone yeah. space? Who would ever think that Apple would go into the search engine space? Well, Apple's going to launch a search engine. I mean, this has been a rumor that's been around for a while. Apple will have a search engine, I guarantee you, very shortly. Mm -hmm. um, and just like Microsoft has a search engine now to try to cut out Google's knees, it, it's a wild time. Yeah, what do you think of it all? I, I would think that you know Google seems to be trying to reach broader and faster and farther yeah. than any of the other folks, much like Microsoft did in its heyday. Uh, I'd like to think that Apple is a little bit more strategic about it, and they try to do hardware-based. I mean, they're always trying to find ways to make money with hardware, right. which I like, uh, because they're sticking to their core. They know how to make money. Right. I think Google has just you know, got this cash cow with advertising. They're like, you know, we're just going to throw stuff against the wall to see yes. what sticks. Yeah. However, didn't Apple buy an ad network? For the iPhone, there was an ad network they bought. Tyler, look it up, or somebody yeah, in the no, chat room tell me. I forgot the name of it, but and they were also ad, in the run. Ad Mob? Was that no, Ad Mob was what Google bought, no. and there was another one. So ad Bright. But is that yes. going to sell Quattro. more ad phones? That's going to sell Quattro. more Quattro. iPhones, right? Well, it's going to give them another revenue stream, right. so that they don't have Google making the money off the iPhone, mm. uh, etc. And Facebook is going to launch currency, you know, yeah. uh, for uh, a virtual currency to right. take Mark Pincus's money. Go ahead, the, Tyler. The funny thing about Google throwing stuff at the wall is. It seems to just st stick there independently, but they actually end up connecting to each other in the sense that when Latitude came out, people were like, meh, Latitude. Now that this is out and people build their profiles, the Google Buzz, you have to build yeah, it a makes profile. More sense. Now your profile is tied to your location and the stuff that you buzz is tied to that location, so they're filling out location data as well. Like it's geo-specific data. Interesting. And when you do a search in Google and you've done a, you filled out a profile, it comes up with your photo right in the result as opposed to every other result related to you, doesn't have your image of yourself right next to it, right? In a Google profile sense. Right. So it has massive SEO benefits if you search for yourself and you do have a Google profile. Yeah. It's going to kill the Facebook ranking or the, you know. You, they'll, the, they'll put themselves number one, maybe. Yeah. Well, or overall. They, they have them listed, they list themselves at the very bottom, mm. but even at the very bottom when it has an icon or avatar. Yeah, it'll, face, be, it'll be a one box. Yeah. Yeah, oh my God, I have 4,585 followers. Now, I had no idea. I mean, it's growing very quickly. It's growing very quickly, and and you know, I mean, is that 
that's that's obviously it's growing because you're posting so much news and no, being active. No, no, it took me years to get to five thousand on Facebook. Right, well, two or three definitely it took me two or three days to get to five thousand on this. That's significant. Well, the, but I mean, don't you think a lot of that is just because when they launched, they just had hundreds of thousands of users. I mean, automatically, you're a user because you have Gmail. I know that. Yes, that is the reason. Right. Which makes it no less significant, so we agree. Yeah. It's right. significant. Whatever, however they did it, it's significant that I, they have already caught up to Facebook. Right, well, yeah. Definitely. What do you think is driving the responsiveness that you talked about before? Is it the ease of use? Is it the fact that everyone already uses Gmail? It is because there is a large contingent of people who can't be bothered to go log into a social network. We all know them. They are us. I mean, how often do you log into Facebook? You know, like rarely. I, I can't go. I, I, the only reason I, I email stuff to my Postgres account, which then sends it to Twitter, my blog, my Flickr, my MySpace, and I don't actually log into any of these services in general. Uh, so you know, Facebook is for me to market what I'm working on. Hmm. Yeah. That's it. We actually discussed mark that. Facebook's a marketing channel for me. We actually discussed that this morning on uh, on the other show that uh, this week in Twitter, this week in Twitter, which uh, you host, which I host. So if people who are fans of this weekend startups can't get enough of Lawn and you want to get a little warm up at 11 a.m. 11 a.m. 11 a.m. Pacific, which is 2 p.m. Eastern. Yes. Which is 7 p.m. <laughs> Sydney the next day. Something. Who knows? Sure. That's anyway, I'll go with that. Whatever it is, you can watch. All, if it's like 20 minutes of Lon is not enough reading the news, you get Lon hosting. It's an hour solid of 300 Lon people. Insights. And what, what was the point that came up in this week? Uh, I was going to say that I actually feel like Posterous, Tumblr, those are sites that are really like now rendered almost obsolete. I mean, you can use Google Buzz exactly like Tumblr. It works almost exactly the it, same it, way. This is, uh, and so your question was, why is it so effective? There's a large contingent of people. This was the unknown, unknown, like, for Facebook, when you're mm -hmm. an entrepreneur, there's like that. There's, there's things that you know are unknown. Like, you don't know how many people need CDN services in the future. You, you don't know what the price will be of things. The unknown, un unknown unknowns is that you you don't even know what question to ask. Mm. And in Facebook's case, their blind side was they actually didn't understand how many people there were out there not participating in social networks. They just, or maybe they did, but I mean, that, I certainly didn't know this. And so what's happened is all of those people who never really participated, now they've got a little, another thing in their inbox that just says, buzz. And it's like, oh, that's like getting an email, getting an email from me with a funny video, or getting a buzz from me with a funny video is now the same thing. Hmm. Whereas me putting a funny video on Twitter or Facebook was a different thing than the funny email. So basically just taking the social network updates and the concept of inbox and making it one means people still live in their inboxes. Yep. We all do. Yeah, and it's it's very sticky too because you see that oh. number update every time you log oh my in. God, yes. You see like there's 85 things waiting for you in your bus. I can't use it because what happens to me is um, it overwhelms your inbox. I would imagine my inbox is absurd, and I I use Google Apps. But uh, can we pull up my um, email box for a second here, uh, my computer? Well, and even, what you'll see here is yeah. look at that. That's from 1 a.m. So where's the buzz part? All of these items with the little icon. Yeah. Those are buzz stories. So when you see that icon, that's what like basically that's a Facebook story now in line yeah. in your inbox. Hmm. So this is blending my inbox. Yeah, that's part of the stickiness too, is if you participate in a thread, it then just emails you basically right. responses and other activity from that thread. So it's very like once you start participating, there's a lot of mechanisms in there to keep you looking and right. and Do you subscribe back. to RSS feeds or is that pretty passive? I, I I do in some cases, but I generally type in the domain names of the 10 places I like. I go to Tech Meme, I have a couple of aggregations, I click on links in Twitter. But look at this, I have one here. Well, that's actually another, uh, it's also integrated with Google Reader. So this Robert Scoble like update. like something on Google Reader, it pulls it into your buzz as look well. Look at this Robert Scoble update. 187 people have commented on it. I'm sorry, you guys can't see this, but look, 187. And then there's another one down here, 103, 150. 150 people commenting, 73. I mean. These are like all in the last day, and these what happens is these things are new if somebody comments. Right, it goes. That means back if you have a hundred comments, it's a new email message a hundred times if you were to clear it each time. So this is not sustainable in your inbox when you're a router like me, or you're following a router like me. So they've got to come up with a better way to follow threads. 
than making it new every time somebody adds. That'd yeah, you can't possibly. Nobody could keep up. All right, next news story, because we can't talk about this all Next day. story. Uh, staying on Google, Google buys Aardvark. In other Google news, the search company purchased social Q&A service Aardvark for re-reported $50 million. Hello. The <laughs> company, started by ex-Googlers, had previously raised $6 million in venture capital. Uh, considering that the site only had about 90,000 users, only about half of which were actually participating in asking and answering questions, does this mean Google paid $50 million for the Q&A algorithm, for the talent? What do you think is their angle here? I'm lost on this one. I mean, I, at $20 million or $30 million, okay, sure, you, you bought a team. Right. But I, I have a sense they bought the team. Well, and the team had already left Google once. I know, but this is one of the things, you know, like you're, if, if you're Google and you think this is important and you have an unlimited amount of money being thrown off and there's 20 people there and you say, you know what, those 20 people, if we incent them properly and have an earnout. They build this inside of our company, they're going to do great. But I mean, I'm looking at Vark.com's Quantcast here. They have like a thousand people a day going. Yes. Well, and also because you could Mahalo use Aardvark. Mahalo has seven, six hundred, six hundred uh, thousand uniques a day. Yeah. They have like a thousand or two. I don't understand that price. I mean, that, may, that puts us at a price of 300 <laughs> times that number. That means we're worth 1.5 billion on, on a, you know, on a user by user basis. But anyway, uh, I, people are very confused. But People buy things for the team all the time, you know. So, yeah. uh, congratulations to them and their and their investors. That nice was exit. Yeah. It's an incredible exit. I think it's not a great product experience. You know, it's it's it depends on what you're asking about. So, in some questions, it works well. Sometimes I've gotten because uh, we tried it out. Cause yeah, we have of an course. Product. We have here, an so. answer product, right? Uh, I, I have had I would say seventy five percent effectiveness. Like sometimes you don't get any good answers. Sometimes you get really good answers, usually kind of in between. putting the question through the VARC system versus tweeting it, what's uh, the difference? I would get better responses from Twitter because I have a Okay, so that's, the, so that's the issue I have is, like, why would I put this, why would I go through VARC to put it there? Like, I can understand putting it on a web page, like Yahoo Answers or Mahalo Answers, because then you get everybody gets to comment on right. it. You may get a, a diverse range of opinions from outside your network. But... There's, there's more fluid ways to, I mean, yeah. maybe it's because they're going to categorize people. So when you say, this is about Japanese food, it goes to Tyler. When I say, this is about, I don't know what you're into, fi film, film, it goes to you. <laughs> you know, like, right. but I would rather just tweet it and have you both, you well, know, ask people, about film. To be fair, a lot of Twitter users don't have the kinds of follower numbers where you can do that. I mean, if you only have 20, 30 people following you, you may then not have Then you're only going to have 20, 30 people in your network on That's VAR. That's true. So, I mean, it's, it's going to mirror it. So, anyway, congratulations to them. I'm not going to play or hate. Um, <laughs> and I do think that they have some interesting features in there that will obviously, if they're really good, will consider put in Mahalo. So we've had lots yeah. of discussions here about adding them to We definitely Mahalo. have. I mean, they've, they've been somebody we've watched here. Yeah, and we've, we have things. always said, we, you know, we have been categorizing what answers people give in certain categories. And we've been waiting, like, hey, when do we turn this on to sort of show who's an expert in which category? Mm -hmm. And should we route questions, which Yahoo does not well? No. So I think they do routing probably better than anybody. Yeah, their, their algorithm of matching like people to questions right. is more effective than anybody else who's done it. Right. To date. So, so congratulations and to them. The site yeah. lives on. You could still use it, and it's in Google Labs now. Right. So now it'll be like somehow connected. Maybe we get connected to Buzz. Maybe we find Buzz. A lot of people were thinking that online that I read was that it's going to have something to do with. Buzz My now. guess is like Dodgeball and other acquisitions. It's it's probably going to have a hard time getting attention inside the organization. It's yeah. very hard inside a big organization like that. So I think for them, it's it's a what it signals to me is that the entrepreneurs didn't really believe in the idea. You know, because if they really believed in it, why would they sell it so quickly? And maybe they need maybe they need cash. I mean, again, people said the same thing about me with Weblogs Inc. But a lot of cash. If people offer you a disproportionate amount of cash, but these guys were Google guys, so they had money already, so it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, why would you sell so quickly? Build it for another couple of years. It's still the re a pretty crazy valuation for what they've done. I guess it's disproportionate, and that's maybe maybe that's the reason it's disproportionate is because the only way to get those guys from to not do it themselves is to give them a disproportionate reward. At twenty-five or thirty-five, maybe they wouldn't have done it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, apparently in December they were offered thirty and they didn't take it. Yeah, right. So that was so maybe they're paying, like I think thirty million dollars to buy a startup, you know, for technology, twenty thirty million dollars to buy a startup based on the technology and team is a reasonable price for a Google or Microsoft. It's reasonable. Fifty is not. So maybe what these guys did was they got Google to make an unreasonable, do an unreasonable deal, which people said I get, had, you know, uh, Weblogs Inc. was an unreasonable deal because it was reportedly 30 times forward-looking revenue or something like that. Uh, so 
Yeah. So that, that means they got a premium of 50 cents on the dollar. So instead of getting 30, they got 50, they got 40% more than they should have. Congratulations to them. Good for them. That's yeah. awesome. Next story. Yes. Uh, we have a new entry into the Deadpool this week. Wah, wah. Vio. Streaming so video site Vio enters wah, the Deadpool. Wah. The company will let go of its remaining workforce and may file for Chapter 7 bankruptcy protection. Though similar to YouTube and its wealth of user-generated content, Vio also featured a selection of network TV content and some movies. The site debuted in beta in March of 2006 and received about $70 million in venture capital over the years from investors including Spark Capital, Goldman Sachs, Time Warner, and former Disney chairman Michael Eisner. Huh. The site had been looking for a buyer but had trouble due to an ongoing legal dispute with Universal Music Group. So where did all of these, I mean, these are not sort of fly-by-night investors. These are major venture capitalists. Where did they all go wrong in online video? How come they couldn't figure it out? Well, let me just say that we should play the Deadpool uh, jingle. Graphic. There we go. That is a really feckin' disgusting Deadpool. <laughs> you who have died, we <laughs> salute you. I'm struck every time when we show that graphic about how disgusting that Deadpool is. It is pretty disgusting. It really, you is. know, the pool here, which was a blow-up kind of pool, yes. like that one of the things, Taurus and Fondue literally ripped it apart. They destroyed it. They destroyed it. So now we have no Deadpool. We have Thanks a symbolic. To my dogs. We have a symbolic Deadpool. They, they lit it was literally outside, like in a pile, and then the dog still would sit in it. They were so <laughs> affectionate for the death in that pool. It, the, the dead, decaying body of Jimmy Wales is just <laughs> animals just love to rip at it. Yeah. Fray it. Um, James, you take this one. I mean, it's a video startup. Why did it fail? Well, all right. So I, I have to Are be, they a client? You have some inside information? Well, I have to be honest and disclose that um, uh, we took over their Los Angeles offices. Uh, and, and, yeah. So uh, When? Uh, this was in January of this year. Just, just two months ago, three months ago. Oh, you took over their office lease? Yes. Oh. So, we, so you we, got a we, good deal. We, yes. So we sort of, uh, you know, uh, maybe had some insight that maybe this was a... Uh, on this way. Um, you know, we had talked to them years ago about their content delivery needs, and they pushed a ton of traffic. Um, you know, I feel like if you're going to get into this space and you're going to go big like they do, you go bigger or you bust. Um, I'd argue that, you know, YouTube could have gone the same direction as these guys did uh. if, uh, you know, Google didn't come along. So uh, there is no clear revenue model in massive video delivery online yet. Uh, Hulu uh, has figured it out because they've got, you know, great content. But I don't necessarily know that Hulu is a for-profit company right now, and mm. or will always be. You know, it's a sure. it's got an ownership model that's different. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. This could have been YouTube's fate. Yeah, Law huge lawsuit, huge CDN bills. Yeah, you know, no monetization. Vio uh, actually had some early advantages against YouTube. The quality was better on. Yes, video. they had yes. a P2P solution. They had yeah. a whole bunch of things going yeah. for them. Uh, it was a fast I. Uh, at the dinner I went to last night, Salar was there, who is now running YouTube, and Chad Hurley, the founder of YouTube, was there. And I was talking to Salar about the idea for taking the Sundance movies and paying for them. That was a good idea. And he, I sent him the video. Uh, and the first thing he said to me is, how does it become sustainable and generate revenue? And I said, well, don't worry about making money. You're Google. Do it for fun. You know? <laughs> and he was like, no. It, we have to, everything we do has to make money at some point. It has to get to that point. So how does it get to that point? And I said, well, why don't you make it like a $100,000 grant or a $250,000 grant. Just make it a $100,000 grant to 20 movies, only $2 million. And they get a sponsor or three to sponsor the whole collection of these are the 20 Sundance movies from mm -hmm. last year that we're going to feature here for free. And it'd be cool. Yeah. And it's not exclusive or whatever. Idea. So he's like, maybe that would work. You know, you get a sponsor or two and you put it up there. If um, you don't spend too much on the movies and the ones that you were still, the whole point was you're buying the movies that don't otherwise get bought. So they're it's looking for distribution. found money for them. Yeah. If, you, if it's $100,000, you know. And I met the guy who produced uh, Napoleon Dynamite, actually. Mm. And uh, I guess was one of the writers on it at the, at the party last night or whatever. And it was interesting. Um, okay. Anyway, it's sad to see people lose their jobs. Uh, any developers out there from VO? Jason at, at Jason. Uh, come talk to me. We'll get you a nice landing here. Uh, no, it's sad, but you know what? They, it's like you're saying, you, in that space you go big. And the music industry has killed more startups, you know? And the only person who has failed more, caused more failure in the internet industry than startups is Jimmy Wells, but than music <laughs> companies right. is Jimmy Wells. I mean, it's really that horrific. I mean, the, mu the music industry just kills everything. They tried to kill YouTube. I mean, YouTube just got out by the yeah. skin of their teeth. Um, and I don't think they still, they haven't settled that lawsuit yet. 
I don't believe so. No, that's still ongoing with the Viacom thing. Yeah. So that's going to be like Discovery yeah, and Madness the forever. Viacom still pending, I think. Yeah. But also, I mean, you've seen YouTube polices itself much better now than ever before. They give the tools to people to do it. If you're a, if you're a mute, not only do they give you the tools to police it, they give you the tools to monetize it. So like, oh, you stole our stuff? Great, now we're making money from it. And they're like, okay, we just looked through the entire database for every time somebody takes New York State of Mind and puts it on their thing, now we're going to monetize it for you and get your money back and sell you MP3s. It is lightning fast now on YouTube. I mean, all the, we were speaking about the luge accident in yeah. the training. Those videos are going up and literally being They pulled. have it on tape? Oh, yeah. oh there's a, there's a oh. there's video. And it's it, as soon as it gets up... You won't, you won't find it on YouTube. Literally, the moment it gets up on YouTube, oh. the Canadian broadcasting company that owns it Turns pulls it, it. And, I mean, the, the turnover has been astonishing. Yeah, well, that means Gawker will have it on their site because Gawker TV hosts it itself. Um, I just want to comment on the luge thing. From what I heard, and you correct me if I'm wrong here about the luge thing. I'm not going to play it or anything like that. Don't play it on the air. It's, it's gruesome. Is it really gruesome? It, it's not. Most of it happens off screen, but it's enough to be sort of uncomfortable to watch. Yeah, well, somebody dying it's a, it's is somebody uncomfortable. Di it, you can see that it is a tragic accident and there is not a way he would Well, here's the it. thing, though, I heard. Um, this track is absurdly fast. Yes. The day, yesterday, one of the other athletes complained that we, and said something to the effect of we are lemmings being thrown down this dangerous thing to our death or something. Oh my, I had not heard of that. Yeah, like smoking gun quote. And um, then this guy uh, goes flying George off the track after, at, yeah. you know, they said it's too fast. And now they're not going to cancel the luge? Well, they've suspended training on this course for now. I don't know if they've been officially announced what's going to happen next. What do you do if you're an athlete? You with, this, with this, with uh, this. Oh, that is a. Well, how, do, what do you, how do you move forward? Like, you've been training for the Olympics, right? This is your, your goal of your whole life, and you're here at the Olympics, and now suddenly you see a course that maybe isn't as kosher as it needs to be. Do you still jump on there and do it? <laughs> well, I know my answer, <laughs> which is absolutely not. No way. But <laughs> I'll see you guys later. But uh, this is why I'm probably not an Olympic athlete. Well, there you go. Um, this is, is Luge L-O-U? L-U-G-E. 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 I never understand. I mean, I'm not going to make jokes about it. I, but I did never understand this sport and I always said to myself this seems too dangerous to be a sport like it's like riding on a motorcycle without handlebars or something you know like well, they, it's too yeah. dangerous it's thrilling I can only imagine right I I you, one thing this will like be extreme sport it's the yeah. adrenaline rush yeah jumping out of a plane is silly right but people do it and they do I, cartwheels and they do crazy stuff and there you go yeah I guess so I mean I, I don't know if there's been a lot um of death to the sport, but... <laughs> you know, uh, you tell people you start a company, people are like, I can't believe you do that. <laughs> right. You're crazy. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. True. Public so. speaking, too. That's his name. People oh, yeah. are more afraid of public speaking than death, isn't it? Oh, being right? naked in public. Some people so. think that's strange. Um, next story. Next story. Okay, moving on. Uh, I'd like to end the show by 3.30. We started at 2.30. That's two hours. Oh, oh one my. So one, so one more. Uh, well... We can do MySpace. It's a pretty big story. I think we can get it in in three minutes. Yeah. Uh, and I, I have a lot of inside information yeah. on this, obviously. Major shakeup at MySpace this week. CEO Owen Van Natta stepped down as CEO a mere nine months after joining the company. He's being replaced by new co-presidents Mike Jones and Jason Hirshhorn. Giga Ohm has reported that the departure was due to conflicts between Van Natta and News Corp's head of digital operations, John Miller, and has essentially declared MySpace a dead property. Their headline is RIP MySpace. Uh, this comes on top of news from TechCrunch that Tom Anderson, who was almost everyone's first MySpace friend, is no longer assigned automatically to new user accounts and hasn't logged into the site since January 24th. So is it time for us to throw MySpace into the Deadpool? No, it is not. I have a lot of inside information here, so I need to do a bunch of disclaimers. Okay. Number one, John Miller was my boss at AOL. Mm -hmm. John Miller is on the board of Mahalo. Yes. John Miller is an investor in Mahalo personally. And News Corp is an investor in Mahalo. I am very close to the situation. I know Owen not well. I know Mike Jones very well. Mike Jones' company, User Plane, was bought by John Miller as well in the same era. Mm -hmm. The companies that win in the internet space are the ones who have um, obsessive, compulsive determination to make the best product, not deal makers and business people. Owen Venata is a nice guy, 
I'm not going to say anything disparaging about him, but I think he would admit that he is a deal guy and a business guy, not an obsessive product guy. I don't know there's a list of products you could say that he personally built. He's the business guy you bring in to scale a business. They brought him in, and then they brought in two product guys under him. Mm. The, and then you have John above him, and then you have Rupert Murdoch above him. There's too many layers of business management, not enough layers of product management. There was some tension there from what I understand. I don't know all the inside uh, stuff. Most of the blogs that I read, and I, of course, have no inside information just right. from what you read on the just internet. Just a disclaimer, you have no connection. Just as I should do a disclaimer, disclaimer I please. don't know anybody involved in this story. Uh, <laughs> from what I read on the blogs, it sounded like there was an internal struggle between sort of John Miller and the uh, News Corp side of things yeah. and Venata, who had a different direction in mind. Yes. And there was sort it, of a power struggle. It there. was a mistake to put Venata in that position. Clearly. I think that everybody feels that. John, Owen, Rupert, and Mike Jones, and Jason Horshorn. All of them probably feel that was not the piece that they needed. They had a reason to do it, I guess. Probably they thought there was more business stuff going on, mm -hmm. maybe doing the deal with Google to re-up the thing. Maybe they thought he, because I think Owen was involved in some of that stuff at Facebook. Yes. Maybe they thought Owen with his connections would do all those business deals really well. But that's not what MySpace needs today. What MySpace needs is Mike Jones to make it fast, stable, and feature-rich, and get out the clutter and noise, and make it best of breed again. That is going to take a long time. Just getting it stable has taken six months, and to stop like the hemorrhaging of users, right. just to get some basic functionality in there, like adding you know, the ability to syndicate your tweets. Um, they need to make it a full-fledged product and catch up to Facebook, Buzz, you know, these things. And then they have to do something innovative. This is going to take three years. It's like doing a startup and a legacy, and you have to take care of this existing business at the same time. It's very hard, and it's all about product. The only discussions they should ha be having there right now, forget about business stuff. That should be off the table. Forget about business stuff. Business will take care of itself if the product is growing. Number one, speed. Number one, stability. Number two, speed. Number three, features, which is what I always say internally at Mahalo. Keep the site up and running. Mm -hmm. Make the site fast, add features. And sometimes I switch the fast and the features, depending on you know, like what we need to get done. Right. Anyway, what are your thoughts? Well, I think the big problem they have is the fickleness of the user community, which yeah. is that you know, once you get to a social network and you like it and you fall in love with it and you sort of you know, love it, you're there. And then if it disappoints you and you move on and you suddenly fall in love with someone else, you don't want two girlfriends. You just, you don't go back. I don't think you do at least. So to your point, I think they have to take a huge leap forward. They can't just have an incremental improvement. It needs to really be the next big thing yeah. in order for people to come back to MySpace. Yeah, I think that's, I think there's, there needs to be that thing that, have you seen what MySpace is doing? It needs right. their version of buzz that just draws people back in. Something truly unique. Uh, and they, it's been a very long time since there's been anything like that on MySpace. Yeah. Last story. You have another one? Is I do. It, anything I important? Uh, anything important? Uh, not not terribly important. We have right, a bunch me, of new services, and then we have something about Amazon giving away free Kindles. Give me give me give me give me the give me the headlines. I'll pick. Uh, okay, Flatter, uh, which was suggested by a user actually who wanted to hear your thoughts on it. Free Kindle. Uh, Amazon is thinking of giving Amazon Prime users a Kindle for free. Packlate.com, a company that wants to help you get last-minute vacation deals, and Proposable, a service that wants to help you create sales proposals online. Mm. Let's hear the Kindle thing. That's the most important one. All right. Amazon already offers its paid Amazon Prime subscribers a chance to buy a Kindle risk-free. If you don't like it, you can return it for a refund. According to TechCrunch, the company may take the even bolder step of just giving a free Kindle to every Amazon Prime member. Currently, Prime costs $79 a year, so the notion would be Prime members are more likely to buy books. Therefore, convincing them to get a Kindle, they're yeah. going to buy more Kindle books. Uh, is this a sign that Ki Amazon is sort of preparing for the iPad, scared of the iPod, or is it just a good strategy generally? Um, the price, uh, well, when you release a product, you should make it expensive, maximize profitability on the dumbasses like me who will buy it the first day. Right. Then uh, you get the people who are a little more savvy, like Tyler who want to wait until the product's more stable and at a better price. Mm -hmm. So like I would buy the iPhone 3GS on the first day. Tyler will probably buy it, what, like six months in, three months in? I'm skipping 3GS and waiting for the 4G. So you, okay, so you're, yeah, yeah so you're I'm like. Still, I'm still on 3G. So he's just, I'm, just, I'm too savvy for that. 
and then they get the laggards. Um, and so they're probably at that point where it's like, you know what, it's, sales are starting to slow. We need to do something to jumpstart this. Let's get those people in the middle who you know, aren't into it. And the profitability comes in the books. They probably have figured out after X many books, they get it's a profitable endeavor, and there's competition coming. It's a great idea. What they really should do is they should say, um, buy five books, get the Kindle for this price. Buy 10 books, get the Kindle for free. So if you have a, I have a Prime account. By the way, Amazon Prime is the greatest thing ever. I mean, you, can, you get free shipping, and it's like whatever the faster shipping is, you get it for free. And you can invite five of your family members to it or something. It's awesome. Um, so I suggest people, uh, I would suggest that they do this. Uh, and even if they lost 50 bucks on each Kindle, um, you know, right now, or 100 bucks, they probably, in aggregate, would get it back because the people who have Kindles buy a lot. Right, yeah. There is going to be a color Kindle that has better web access. That's the report. So, but Kindle, people say on the, on the Apple tablet, it's too heavy and it's not for reading books. So for book reading, the iTablet will not do it. For magazine reading, iTablet and newspapers will be better on that. You hit the nail on the head with the idea of uh, get the library into the book, into the tablet right away. Right. Because if you've got 100 books on that that you haven't read, well, it doesn't matter if the fancy iPad comes out. You got a hundred books sitting here. You yeah. got to read those, and you got to get through them. That's a good them. point. Yeah. And so I think that that needs to be the incentive, and that's what they're missing. Because right now, if you give somebody something for nothing, well, that's what it's worth to them. Nothing. They're not going to open it. Right. And so I think that they'll just wait. Oh, I got a free Kindle. Maybe I'll use it every now and then. But I'm going to wait yeah. for the uh, you know the iPad, and I'm going right. to use that. Yeah. Then maybe that would be a better incentive and structure. Yeah, that definitely should. That's a good idea. Or I always thought that this is a subscription model thing, like Audible. So I am an Audible member. I pay, I think, 15 bucks a month. So I pay $180 a year at Audible. I get two audio books with my gold membership. They're not a sponsor of the show. They were a sponsor of the show. I'm sure they will be again. Mm -hmm. um, but I've always loved that product, and I like to listen to audio books. If they said to me, Jason, get the platinum membership of Audible, which is, I think, three mm -hmm. books or four books, and we'll throw in a Kindle, and that's 30 bucks a month, and you have to have that for two years, that's another $300. Of which they have to give half to the book publisher, 150 bucks. So right. sure, makes sense. They could get me if they, if they said to me, "We will give you one ebook, one ebook, two audio books, 25 bucks a month." I'm in. I'm in. There's a lot of people who are in. People like a subscription. I yeah. love that, yeah. and it's a great thing to give as a gift. Yeah, if I can get a free ebook for every hundred dollars I spend, if I'm a Prime user, so if I'm just on Amazon and doing whatever, and then you know I earn a credit for an ebook because I spent a hundred bucks buying Amazon products, that'll make me want to use the Kindle more because I'm going to build my library. Yeah, you're going to have yeah. more more to read on it. Okay, uh, I love the domain noob is like, is Jason really scanning the chat without interrupting a stream of thought? Yes, I am. Um, multitasking. It's called multitasking, but you do get the plus. Uh, this has been a great show. Uh, next week, Michael Roberson is going to be on. You may remember him from mp3.com. Mm, wow. And he also Quite did Gizmo5, which he sold to Google. He's in San Diego. He's a great guy. You know him? No. Really good, great entrepreneur. Uh, James, thank you for being on the program. Pleasure. Uh, Edgecast, I know, is crushing it. You have a lot of job openings, we I do. understand. Yes, we do. You're hiring 10 people? Mm -hmm. Uh, we've actually, we're going to have 25 to 30 people we're hiring in the next three months, so wow. uh, careers at Edgecast. Wait a second, wait, 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 hold on a second. <laughs> you can't just drop that, I mean, not ask. Are you raising another round of funding? How do you pay for 25 more jobs? Uh, there'll probably be a growth round coming soon, yeah. Growth round? Mmm, I like it. Uh, when people say growth round just for the fans at home, that means a big round. Like, we're doing good, and maybe your growth round means you're going to acquire something. So we did talk a little bit before. But do you like to buy stuff, or do you just you're more like a building type company? I'm a builder, not a buyer. Yeah, buy, I never liked the buying thing. No, it's just too much of a pain in the ass. Integration. I just don't like wearing other people's clothes. You know, I like yeah. to do it my own. You buy a house and you keep the sofa that they've been sitting on for two. Yeah, no. Oh, yucky. <laughs> I moved into my house. The refrigerator. I was like, oh my god, get this refrigerator. I, I couldn't even. You can't use the other refrigerator. Ah, you know, OCD. Emptied it out, OCD. Right? No, OCD. <laughs> OCD. I'm it wasn't just like thinking still a ham in it or anything. That, we lived with that refrigerator for a couple of months, mm -hmm. and I would just got so OCD about it, imagining their food in there. Because <laughs> they, they, they didn't keep the house clean. They didn't right. even like garden, and it's thinking about the refrigerator, and there's probably like fungus on that food, and you like to, wow. you have stuff with um, well, it's like mold. That's, yeah, it's true. And then you, we clean it with, hot, what about that? Maybe there's mold in a crack. This is the last time I sell my house to you. <laughs> Listen, James, I told you. <laughs> Yeah. Get that moldy fruit out of here. Uh, people thought it was pretty funny. No, I can't take... Oh. 
That's a little. That's a little obsessive. With the view with the can't have your I, food where other people's food has been. I can't touch through. When I go into a hotel room now, mm -hmm. and I want to watch television, I take a sheet, <laughs> and I wrap the sheet around the remote control to press the buttons. You're gonna sleep in the bed. Pure, though? Purell. I don't know. I, and I do that too. I take I, Purell and yeah. I will drop Purell yeah. right on the remote and my hands. Not enough. Big on the Purell. Not enough. Wow. I just don't want to touch it. I just I think like maybe somebody went to the bathroom and then they they probably did. I mean, and then they touched the remote wrong. control and they did, I I can tell you clearly cuz I'm a guy. Like guys, you go to the I'll go to like a Laker game and you'll see some guy come out of the bathroom stall and walk right past the sinks. Just I'm done. Yeah. I came back to the game. Movie theaters, too, all the time. It's oh. a movie, and people don't want to miss. Wash your hands. <laughs> and then I watch other guys go, and they wash their hands. And, this, and it's almost like they're doing it like there's some reverse OCD thing where they, if they just go bang and wipe one hand on her like yeah, that. and the then they try, I'm like, that wash. Is, the perfecting wash is even more irritating. Right. you got to press the button and get, get it going for a little Give while. A little Give it, I'm 30 seconds. I count. 30, 29. <laughs> get in there. It's good. That's normal. Yeah, it's no you are you are sick less than uh, most people I know. I, I never will, get I will sick. I'll give you that. You're no, not, you don't get don't. sick very much. No. I and what do I do when somebody gets sick and they come to this office? Yeah, it's we, we, the hazmat team comes out. I tell people you, you, you can't you're, come back. You cannot. I've thrown people out of the office. They come in there. So you throw me out of the office. Yeah, you were sneezing and you're you're next to me. What are you thinking? <laughs> Sorry. But were you not sick? Oh, I, I I had a cold. I mean, I feel like I was past the contagious part of Which you the know cold. Wh how? Well, you know, when, you have, when you're sick for like two, three days, and then you're getting over it. You're getting over it. So you're you not have no, You are not a doctor. No, you, no you, you could quite possibly be infectious. You don't know that. That's you're right. making that up. That is just some wives' tale. I do not have a medical degree. That's yes. Right. So this is, every, oh, no, I'm over it. And you know what it is? I appreciate that people want to be warriors. You're a hardworking guy. You don't want to miss the show. Okay, you don't want to miss something right. that's going on. You're a leader. That's fine. But... Just stay home. And, and then the other thing is people get sick and they don't go to the doctor. And if you go get that Z-Pack, Z-Pack? Mm -hmm. Z-Pack? What is it called? Z-Pack. 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 It costs nothing and I'm paying for health insurance for everybody and then they won't go get a Z-Pack. You get Z-Pack, you take it. It kills everything in your system. Everything. So if you had something you didn't know about, it's gone. And after two days, three days with that, you're fine. I went to the World Series of Poker. There you have 3,000, 4,000 people playing per day who are poker players, which are the dirtiest people you've ever seen in your life, yeah. by and large, all touching the same chips. And not only do they touch the chips, they sit there and play with them with those grimy hands. And they wipe their nose. Oh, wiping the and nose yeah. and the grimy hands. Yeah, yeah. And I would wear plastic gloves if I could at that game. Howie Mandel it up. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And they then, um, everybody's getting sick because you have nine people at a table and there's literally a hundred tables in a room thousand people in a room and it's a table like this you're close i start feeling a little tickle in my throat my friends are feeling sick my <coughs> wife says i'm calling the doctor we're at the win mm. i'm like i can't go to the doctor at the world series she's like we're in the win this is like the win hotel this is like the win suites player style you know it's j cal style she calls downstairs she's like can you send the doctor like, oh yeah we got a doctor sure they send a doctor up doctor comes he gets there in like an hour which is amazing he takes my blood pressure. I gotta do a, I gotta do a workup on you. Takes my blood pressure, takes my pulse, temperature. He's like, yep, gives me a Z-Pack. Then he says, is there anything else I can get you? <laughs> this, this, some, like, this is some a, kind of service. <laughs> this is Las Vegas. <laughs> so I think for a second and I'm like, hmm, what if I can't sleep? So I'm like, Ambien? So he's like, yeah, sure, here's some here's 10 Ambien. So I was like, great. I still have the 10 Ambiens I keep in my bag. The right, yeah. only time I use Ambien is I'm like rebooting, going to a different country. But, um, <laughs> I'm fine. One of my friends, two of my friends, got so sick that they had their eyes tearing. They were sick for weeks. This is a public service announcement from your friends at This Week in Startups. If you are sick, take a Z-Pack, go to the doctor. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, uh, Bing, Bing, Bing. Uh, thank you to uh, Joel Spolsky for calling in. That was a treat. Everybody go check on Joel on software. Thanks to DNA Mail, uh, DNA Mail, DNA Mail. Everybody loves DNA Mail. Thanks to Rob of Babblefish. Thank you, Sean of There Now. Two really great call-ins, did you think, Tyler? Yeah. 
Tyler, are you distracted today or something? They, they is, this, were, is this show not a priority today for you? I have my, my back is tweaked. Like, I, have you noticed? I, I'm not even sitting right. No, I know. In most episodes, you're running all around yeah, the no, studio. But I have a headache and. I said things wrong, right? Yeah. You okay? Yeah, no, my back hurts. Sure, you're okay. My back hurts, so I can't. I have take a Z-pack. I just find no, no, that's not gonna help. You gotta get Motrin, but I mean, because yeah. you're not. It's like the, the insights are low. You're not yeah, low I'm, energy. Everything. Yeah, I, I'm having trouble moving. I'm like, mm. I have to be like, mm. you know. Very, right. very I careful. was going to talk. I was actually going to talk to you after the show and be like, "You got to bring it a little bit more." But if you're going to claim that you got a bad back, that's uh, that's a uh, that's a valid claim. I hate that uh, back. That's pain. What, what did we talk about so we half an hour about. before the show started? Yeah. I believe you. I, I, and back pain is debilitating. Yeah. And psychological. Yeah. In a lot of cases, you need to go uh, maybe uh, get a Thai massage. I tried last night. You tried to get one? Yeah. Did you get it? No, there's this little massage place over here called Sun Massage. Little, okay. Uh, it's, a little, it's a little questionable, that <laughs> okay, one. Okay, hold on I a second. Know. If it's a, I don't think I can endorse that I, I, Let me explain something. If the, if the massage place <laughs> yeah. is got a neon sign, it does. <laughs> yes. you don't go. No, I knew, I knew better. There, there is, is a Thai massage place in Westwood. There's a couple of them that are like 60 bucks for an hour and a half. It's unbelievably cheap, and they are incredible. And then some tea... And some sleep and a lot of water and, uh, and a bunch of Motrins. You'll be fine. But I was going to talk to him after the show because it's he, he, noticeable, right? Uh, you know, he still has some good insights, I think, this but week. It was, Better it was like than 60, last week. But last week he wasn't even a little, a little. You know, you can tell that he's not at, at peak. He's you can not tell this is peak. not peak Tyler. Uh, Web Spy, Web Spy, give it a try. Love those guys. Uh, thank you to Web Spy for sponsoring the show. James, thank you. Edgecast is hiring. A lot of people. 30 and people. the best way for them to do that is what? Jobs at Edgecast? Careers at Edgecast.com. Careers at Edgecast.com. Email. Uh, just put twist or this. We can start us in the subject line so they know that you're a super fan. Yep. And um, Power VPS, thank you again. Uh, right after this show is This Week in Android. What mm. we're going to try to do here is, just so people know on the thisweekend.com, thisweekend.com will have a website. It's going to have all of this weekend shows. I cleared this with Leo Laporte of This Week in Tech, so don't start trouble. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if a couple people DM'd me on oh Twitter. Oh, my God, it's like, Jason. Da, 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 I'm da. telling Leo you guys are stealing his format. No. Leo said, Mazel Tov, go do it. I can't do every This weekend show. There's mm -hmm. plenty of other people using that format. We bought the domain name This Week went in. We're going to syndicate his show. to our network. He'll syndicate ours. Oh, that's very nice. My hope is that we can, when we sell advertising for these shows, we can sell into him. And vice versa, because he's got such massive distribution. Maybe he's yeah. got a slot open. We can help sell it. Um, and so we'll have this week in Twitter, mm -hmm. this week in startups, this week in Android. Those three have already launched. You can yes, and they're doing well. Right now. Then after that, we're going to do another show. I think we can do this week in cloud computing. With That's next, next up, yeah. I think. Uh, and so we're going to just keep adding these shows, and we're going to try to make Friday the like sort of block of tech shows, just tons of tech shows. And mm -hmm. then... Sunday, when Kevin Pollack has his shows, that might be the block of entertainment shows. So you could imagine a This Weekend something that's entertainment related. We'll get to that later. That could be Sunday. Right. So you could have two shows leading into Kevin Pollack's amazing show. It'd be interesting, right? I think it's, yeah. It's so if you have like ideas a network for this, feeling. You yeah, know. Somebody says, uh, yeah. So anyway, you know, the people in the chat room, yes, you have a good idea. What shirt is Jason wearing? Everybody just said that over oh, and over again. Right, I will yeah. tell you. This is the Mahalo Fit Club shirt. Every uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, we have Mahalo Fit Club, which is done by Jeff here, who's a developer, and we do uh, CrossFit training. And, and it's, you can see here my warriors at Mahalo. These guys are maniacs. Um, you selling those online? You can only get this if you complete five Fit Clubs. Hmm. So even people in the company, you have to do it. But he had like 14 people out of the 25 or 30 people in this office out there nice. the last couple it's, times. It's growing, yeah. And yeah. The, the, the physical pain that you can hear everyone in oh, out it's there. Oh, it's From horrible. From inside the office, you can hear them grunting I hear you're going to take the uh, basic class. There's going to be a basic yeah, class. It's going to be a new, right. I, I can't start in the middle at You go to the new But you do Taekwondo here with me. I do, I do Taekwondo. You do Taekwondo on Sunday, and uh, you're very good at it. The culture here, pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, it's a, well, it's definitely a high. community sort of vibe here now that, that I think for the first time really ever. Really tight, yeah. And it, it's almost cult-like. A little, a little, there's, for outsiders, it may be a little creepy at first. Very, you, you'd yeah. get into it. You get, get into it. it. You get yeah. into it. You drink the Kool-Aid. It's really good, actually. I'm going to do a show on culture documents. And 
right, because I was talking to people about culture and mm -hmm. Tony Shea and everything like that. Do you have a culture document at your company, James? No, we don't, but it's actually something that we've been talking about, yeah. uh, how to articulate our culture right. within the company. I'll, sh I'll share with what, what we did. It's pretty cool. Uh, you, you guys are actually doing some very cool things here. I just took a tour around before I came. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I saw some of the perks. And, uh, yeah. Perks are very big here. Yeah. You spend $4,000 per employee on, like, not health benefits, things above and beyond. No, I mean, I, do you tell people what you, you should do? We tell them when they come to go for a job interview. It's breakfast, lunch, 3 o'clock, we bring a fruit bowl with nuts to your desk. 5 o'clock, we bring a cheese, prosciutto, cheese, meat, cheese yeah. meat, vegetable plate, 5 o'clock. And the reason I do those 3 and 5 o'clock is because I get so hungry, and I'm working and writing, and then I don't get up, and then I get ravenously hungry, and then it's a disaster. And... The laundry, I mean. Uh, oh, and then we have laundry. So you bring your laundry in, and the laundry is done and given back to you. Car service? Car wash. Car wash every six Car weeks. Car wash every six weeks. Gym. And then we have the gym stuff, and then we're going to have haircuts. So for Tyler, really. No really time excited. massage. No time massage. Where is that? Yeah, where's the time massage? Uh, I don't want to be gratuitous. <laughs> 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 He's got a chef. <laughs> uh, uh, what are the VCs thinking? Yeah. <laughs> what are the investors in this minute. company thinking? <laughs> The only thing they think, I'll be totally honest, if your traffic is good and revenue is good, which it is in Miles' case, uh, knock on wood, um, nobody cares. Mm. If things are not going well and you're doing that kind of stuff, you look like an idiot. That's why I waited till everything was good and started adding that kind of stuff. Right. Yep. It's better. It's appropriate. That makes sense, yeah. Anyway, good James, stuff. thanks for being on the show. Uh, we'll see you all next week when our guest is Michael Roberson, an amazing entrepreneur. And make sure you read this week in... Startups.com, with Scott Simcoe is doing all the super fan posts. He's doing like five posts a week, and they're awesome. And get involved in the comments. The people who get involved in the comments, we get to know, which is awesome. This week in Android coming up next. Stay tuned. I spiked out. I could trip a referee. Tell by my attitude that I most definitely leave from. No.